Klockan är nio. It's nine o'clock and uh, we're in session. The party leaders debate. And the following debating rules apply. The <coughs> rules mean that the Prime Minister and the leader of the moderate party are entitled to a speech of no more than seven minutes. And the other party leaders are entitled to a speech of no more than five minutes. And uh, we do those speeches in order of relative size of the parties. There are no right of rejoinder on those speeches. We'll then have a second round where speeches will be no more than two minutes and where we have a free right of reply to the speeches uh, taken in the order of re- relative size of the parties and the do method, uh, a total of no more than four minutes per duel. The speeches are made from the speaker's chair in the rostrum and the rejoinders are made from the speaker's chairs in front of the rostrum. And we will begin with the Prime Minister, Stefan Levin, from the Social Democratic Party. Please. Mr. Speaker, two weeks ago we entered a new decade. On New Year's Eve, people gathered all over the country to say goodbye to the old year and welcome the new year. And to many people, the transition from one year to the next is a moment of hope about their own lives, but also about our country, the world around us and the future. For that reason, we have an important year and an important decade ahead of us in Sweden. And my hope is that the political debate is tough and sharp, but always with respect and with focus on what we want to achieve. The people we represent, the country we lead, deserves our cooperation and that we take responsibility for the future so that people's hope for Sweden may become true. Mr. Speaker, the start of the new year has given us a brutal reminder of the importance of international cooperation as well. A civilian aircraft with Swedes on board, among others, was shot down, and that's a terrible strategy, uh, s- s- terrible tra- s- s- tragedy. I feel strongly with all of you who have lost your Uh, close relations, you are not alone and we share your grief. Whether it's a mistake or not, we condemn this uh, uh, attack and the initial denial and we demand that Iran now takes full responsibility. In the continued investigation, Iran needs to cooperate without restrictions, without if and buts. The countries that have been affected should have full insight into the investigation and the possibility to Tribute with national expertise, and they should also meet with full cooperation from Iran. Mr. Speaker, the, most, the recent military and rhetoric um, escalation in the Gulf area is very serious. The risk of an escalating violence spiral with devastating consequences remains. The government continues to follow the development and take action. There is need for a joint EU coordination effort, and Sweden will continue to work for restraint, dialogue and a political solution. In Australia, brutal fires have ravaged the country. People have died. Men and women have lost their homes when the fire has destroyed everything in its path. We feel with the population of Australia, but we also need to do what is absolutely necessary to stop climate change. Sweden's work for this continues intensely and without interruption at home and internationally by listening to research and with the objective to become the generation that succeeds with the transition. In... uh, troublesome world, Sweden should always be a voice and a guarantor for democracy, for human rights, for international cooperation. But to achieve that, we need to have a strong and robust society here at home. Mr. Speaker, the major project for Sweden in this decade should be the restoration of a strong society built on a sense of community. We have built a strong country before. The People's Home was initiated almost 100 years ago. It was a difficult project, but by giving priority to general wealth fair and the idea that all inhabitants should be equal, Sweden became a a flourishing country and now it's time to do this again. Our welfare state needs to be repaired. Equality and equal opportunities should be given priority and safety and security should be guaranteed. The Social Democrats is the Swedish, it's the welfare party of Sweden. I've said it before and I'm I'm saying it again. Yes, we will need even more money for the municipalities and the regions because welfare should always be our main priority. But in a strong society, there is no room for cuddling 
either. Systems where companies allow people with private health insurance uh, be given priority in the healthcare queue must be broken. Care should be given to those who need it the most, not to those who can pay. The uh, free choice uh, of school system that benefits those whose parents had the uh, uh, opportunity to put their children in a queue must be changed. Equal opportunities at school must be strengthened. And in a strong society, our rules should apply everywhere, everywhere. And for that reason, uh, the police must be given what they need in order to stop the shootings, the explosions and the recruitment of teenagers. We must not make a difference between uh, ethnicity, skin colour or religion, and we should not uh, ignore anyone who commits a crime. Our strong society is not just based on the public, but the idea that every human being contributes to society by raising children, be active in an organization for the elderly, or be uh, working for a women's refuge. In a strong society, based on duty and rights, every person should know that they are a part of society, that all, they're all a part of the community. We all perform our duty for Sweden, but in exchange for that, we have a whole society that does everything to make people's uh, future something to look forward to. Right and duty applies to everyone, and our community should always be inclusive, but not without demands. Those who are born in another country, but who are now included in the community of our country, have the same rights and the same duties, and should be equal to the neighbors whose family have lived here for generations. Welfare, safety, equality, that's how we restore the strong society and take responsibility for the future, and that should be our project for this decade. Mr. Speaker, the Swedish society was built up in a troublesome world by a generation who remembered starvation. And when you think about that, what we, when we look at what Sweden can do today, it's an incredible thought. We should do this by taking responsibility for our country, by always giving priority to jobs and to welfare. We take responsibility for the future by restoring the strong society and build safety and security in everyday life for people and contribute to safety and security in the world. This is how we are going to make this decade a strong decade for Sweden. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, the next uh, speaker will be Mr. Ulf Christensen from the Moderate Party. A tall man. Mr. Speaker, this is the beginning of a new decade. The new decade has just begun. And we are facing a year that will be filled with threats and opportunities. The explosions last Monday in Stockholm and Uppsala shows us that we have a historic task ahead of us. The Severe criminality, marginalization, immigration, poor integration, failures with schools, well, all of these things require us to act now. For a Sweden, that will be better tomorrow. Only if we do what we have to, we can be what we want. I believe in Sweden. I was raised with that conviction that hard work and effort would produce results, regardless be it in school, with the athletics or at work. And millions of Swedes were raised with the same ideals, thinking that problems are there to be solved. If uh, what you've tried does not work, then you have to try something better. You have to learn from mistakes, your own and others, and that should go for politics as well. In the 90s, Sweden started 
to deal with the financial problems. We launched big reforms that shaped the foundation for many years of growth. About 20 years ago, many realized, both left and right, that marginalization had become one of the big problems in Sweden. Joran Persson said then that sick leave should be cut by half, and the Alliance government re-established the so-called work line. And I base my optimism on the fact that we together have solved difficult problems in the past, and we can do so again. I'm not naive, um, I'm not pessimistic, I'm realistic in my optimism. The reforms that reduced the budget deficit and increased growth, that, that took time and the work line took several years to implement and we were in a hurry. But we understood the problems and we spoke plain language and we carried out those difficult decisions and only if you take problems seriously, if you have an idea as to what should be done instead, only then can you lead and uh, be successful. Sweden now has to see the potential in the documented ability we have to be successful. We have to move from words to action because the situation is very serious. The development we see in society today is uh, appalling. We see distrust, we see devaluation in trust, and we see no leadership whatsoever. This is not my Sweden. The government we have has lost control over dependencies on grants and subsidies, uh, criminality, waiting times for care, immigration, integration. They have lost control as to who are here here in Sweden, and this government has lost control over societal developments. The last three years, 130 individuals have been killed. We've had some 1,000 shootings. Sweden are almost top of the list in the EU, and the explosions, well, there is no international equivalent. We have seen hand grenades, we have seen homemade bombs, we have seen houses and cars being destroyed. Two individuals have been killed, and lives have been put at risk. And there was a miracle the other night that no one was injured by those explosions. But last Friday in Uppsala, a child was killed, a 16-year-old kid. I do remember back in October 2007, a person was uh, beaten to death, and there were tens of thousands of people out in the streets demonstrating against that violence. But in January 2020, nothing like that happened. And this has been said before, but we cannot allow violence to be normalized. We see also that municipalities are forced to, to give notice to individuals working in the healthcare sector. Cancer queues have been doubled since this government started. And we see lines, waiting times for children, psychiatry triple. And there are reports on people cheating to get subsidies and grants, and we see that payments are being made correctly, systematically in Malmö. We saw the other day in the papers that there is a woman who probably defrauded the municipality and got some half a million krona in grants. And what you're to do is to review plans and make new decisions. The moderate party tomorrow will present a fully financed extraordinary budget that we will present for the finance committee with more money for welfare, for the municipalities, for the police and for the justice system. The, govern the parliament now have to make the correct priorities because the government either does not want to or can not. If we do not do this, then Sweden will fall apart and it will not be able to fix it. We have to look at the institutions of society and we have to ensure that citizens feel trust in each other. Societal problems grow day by day and the government is discussing the order of the seven three points that they have decided on but this government the Stefan Levin government cannot make the necessary decisions and cannot make the proper priorities as to what to do with our tax money we have seen in the survey that 11 percent of the Swedish population believe in the January agreement and more and more people are now asking themselves did anything at all improve in Sweden during the last year. The only thing, the only thing that could 
get us out of this political paralysation is an extraordinary election. Then the Swedish population will be able to make a new decision about what Sweden is to do in this new decade. Are we happy or do we need to change to a new direction. We can give and take mandates. And if you cannot lead the country, then you're not supposed to lead the country. The moderate party, we're politically and organizationally ready to meet uh, citizens. And Sweden needs a new government as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Jimmy Åkesson from the Sweden Democrats. Please take the floor. Mr. Speaker, unfortunately, we have to establish that the past year, 2019, was a lost year in many ways insecurity, unsafety, division, injustice, all this continued to penetrate even deeper into Sweden as a nation. It continued to divide our country and divide communities, continued to um, strike discord between people. 276 explosions until mid-November. 316 confirmed shootings, out of which 38 resulted in deaths until mid-December. Almost half of Swedish women from 20 to 24 years of age choose to travel in a different way because they are afraid that they will be subjected to criminal acts. These numbers are not good, Mr. Speaker. This is the cold, harsh reality for many people who live in Sweden today. Crime on the rise, unsafety and security forces us to rearrange our lives, to adapt our lives accordingly. We are forced to adapt to a chaotic surrounding that keeps leaving its mark on our everyday lives. We are forced to surrender part of the freedoms that many of the rest of us take for granted. Mr. Speaker, the inability to address these deeply rooted problems means that not even a tenth of the Swedish population feel that the government policies measure up. And what is even more remarkable, not even the government party's own voters are particularly impressed. Just over two out of ten feel that the leftist liberal policies are good enough. And that speaks volumes when not even the own sympathizers understand the sense of what is going on. Well, then things have gotten very, very far out of hand, Mr. Speaker. We have a government who lacks insight entirely into the fact that we're in a crisis, a government that completely lacks the ability to identify real problems and subsequently have no ability to, to identify solutions for these problems. We have a basis for our government that is so divided in uh, trying to find some sort of common ground that uh, we must uh, consider that it doesn't exist. This era of policies started, uh, Mr. Speaker, with Annie Löw and Stefan Löfven, and hopefully this type of policies will end with Annie Löw and Stefan Löfven. In this situation, when our welfare state is disintegrating, when expenditure is on the rise, when social, cultural and economic division is so pressing, not even now do we get something that even is similar to a rational reaction from the government, and that is astounding. Instead of putting an end to failed policies, they continue. They continue in the same direction. Last year, almost 120,000 residence permits were granted in our country. 120,000 people, which corresponds to the 12th largest city in our country, Lund, in one single year. Mr. Speaker, this must come to an end right now. This must come to an end. 
an end to empty words, end to slogans with no meaning, end to these kind of policies that have only been detrimental to our country, our elderly, our sick people, our children, our young people, shouldn't have to foot the bill because politicians leave them in the stitch. We need a chain of clear political decisions to achieve uh, a turnaround to the negative development we can see. Policies striving towards net minders when it comes to uh, immigration is a basic uh, condition for this. Clear signals that Sweden is full. These signals must go out. Denmark's done it, Finland's done this, Norway's done this, and Sweden must go ahead and send these signals out. And we need to repair the holes that have been torn in our welfare system. Employees in care and healthcare sectors need to have peace to work in. They need much more resources than the resources allocated by this government. And, Mr. Speaker, we need to strengthen the entire judiciary. Thank you. Thank you. We continue with the Centre Party and Anders V. Johnson, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. From uh, my hometown, Hildevle, to Stockholm, it takes about an hour and a half on a train. And this journey takes me from one of the biggest labour market regions in northern London, uh, past fields, forest, uh, past Uppsala with academia. We go on the train past small town industrial areas where small companies and well-known brands are side by side and eventually we end up here in Stockholm in the capital. This is a journey, an hour and a half, uh, through what builds Sweden, what makes Sweden strong. The interplay between industry, academia, green sectors, small companies, logistics centers and export companies. This is also a journey that reminds us of how important it is with politics that can enhance what we have, that understand that the conditions we have are different depending on where we get on or off the train. Sweden might be a country that is doing well in many ways. We have some five million people who have a job to go to. We have companies that are world leaders in many sectors, but nevertheless, we have big challenges. If Sweden is to become, become a stronger and safer country, we have to meet those challenges. We have to continue to reduce taxes for companies, and at the same time, we have to change the Swedish labor market so that uh, those with no or low training can find a first job. We have to improve the Swedish legal system. We have to have more police officers in the streets. We have to apprehend and punish those who commit crime or who recruit others to commit crime. We have to close that gap between cities and countryside. We have to ensure that the people who contribute or have contributed through a full working life will have the same access to care and health care, regardless of where in the country you live. The Centre Party has been the driving force to ensure that the Swedish health care care system is to be strengthened. We now have a billion that will be spent on reducing waiting times. We're giving more money to children's psychiatry. And these are important steps ahead so that we get a better healthcare system that is closer to the citizens, but many things remain to be done. And the Centre Party, we want to, want to have more uh, student healthcare, more student nurses. We want to see more preventive work in uh, the um, um, care system. And we want to have better career possibilities for those who work in the healthcare sector. They're amazing and that uh, they provide first class care every day, and we need to improve even more when it comes to health care. We're facing challenges, and here we need politicians who take responsibility for the finances, who invest so that we can get development and growth, politicians who understand that we need to use every single tax krona 
wisely. And here, the state, the government has to take responsibility. We will give another five billion to municipalities and regions in the budget 2020. That's good, but it will not be enough. The Swedish healthcare system will need more money. We see a need. We'll add, have to add many billions uh, next few years, and that is why the centre party to, uh, will, when we start the budget negotiations, push for more money for municipalities and regions so that we can ensure that everyone in Sweden will get access to that close, accessible, available care so that we can reduce that gap between countryside and uh, uh, cities uh, and build a stronger Sweden. We have <laughs> taken responsibility uh, through the January agreement, and thanks to the Centre Party, we got a government uh, that uh, safeguards openness and tolerance, that will have liberal reforms, uh, more jobs, uh, who want to work with environmental climate policy to produce results uh, so that we get more stronger companies to cross the country. and. Uh, this is something where we build on previous successes and the fact that if you strengthen the individual and the companies, then you also strengthen Sweden as a country. The Centre Party will continue this work to reduce those differences, to close that gap between those who have a job and those who have not, to those who decide to live in a town, a city or in the rural areas. We are going to continue to fight for a country where more people feel safe, where we have no deadly violence or organized crime. We are going to do what is right and not just what it is easy. And that is the way to bring all of Sweden <coughs> forwards. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Jonas Sjöstedt from the Left Party. Mr. Speaker, members, spectators, the January agreement turned one year the other day. The celebrations out in our towns and squares was not so active. Last year we had a right-wing budget from the moderate Christian Democrats and supported by the Sweden Democrats, which meant lower taxes for those who earn a lot and less money for the welfare systems. We could tell. Today we have a budget from the January parties, lower taxes for those who earn the most, no money to the regions and municipalities. The welfare crisis in Sweden is getting stronger. And we can tell. When I was in Lulia, we visited, uh, visited schools where they tried to close schools down in panics. In Kiruna, two out of three student uh, as assistants have to leave, even though they are needed. In Eskilstuna, the municipality want to sell the uh, municipal housing, even though there is objections from the tenants in uh, Swed Stockholm Healthcare, even though they're under pressure. Many people are being made redundant. So. The, the people in charge do not seem to know quite what they're doing. This is the situation all across Sweden. It is the government's responsibility to ensure that the welfare crisis is halted in Sweden. Yesterday, we in the left party declared that we want to see at least 10 billion kroner extra go to the municipalities and regions. This is necessary just to maintain the level of quality in our services today. Really, we need more. And next year, we will actually actually need even more. We cannot promise lowered taxes to those who earn the most and to say at the same time that we can still keep up the welfare system. That's not possible. This is a political choice. And I hope today that we will hear from the government that they will keep their election promises to put the welfare systems first. It's time to deliver on that promise now. And it's not uh, good enough to say, well, it will happen in April or next year, because now people are being fired from schools in Kiruna. Now mother and baby centres are being closed down. Down. It's now that nurses in emergency healthcare services in Stockholm are starting to think, do I actually have the stamina to keep working doing this? It's, action is required now. The welfare crisis in Sweden makes Sweden more unequal, more unsafe. People are starting to wonder if they need private healthcare insurance, if they can trust their children's schools. 
the government wants to proceed and make Sweden even more unsafe and unequal. They want to smash the employment security of wage earners. If you worsen the rules in employment as prescribed by the January Agreement, that is arbitrary. That is a recipe for the boss to be able to fire the one who has who is worn out. If somebody has objected to unfair treatment, they will be let go in this system. This is a poor system, a system where free trade unions with good legislation as their support negotiate um, the terms and conditions. That system should be safeguarded. We risk having workplaces that are quiet, anxious. We need to stop using the employment form of a certain limited time period. We need to improve the everyday lives of people who are on hourly contracts not getting enough hours. The government also wants to introduce market line rents in new produced <coughs> housing. It is obvious what will happen with a market rents and acute housing shortage. Rents will go up, segregation will increase, cr overcrowding in housing will increase, desperation for people who can't get housing will increase. The Swedish housing market uh, does not have a problem that re that is related to too low rents. Uh, it's about not having enough housing at reasonable rents. We can solve this by building housing with reasonable rents, by having a plan to build our way out of the housing shortage. Tenants today often lack power too much. Too many are forced out of their apartments after, out, after renovations that is much more thorough than requested. Much of the contents of the January Agreement is poor, but the January Agreement is also constructed on an illusion. It's based on the illusion that the January Agreement parties are in majority. We have a minority agreement, a government with a minority collaboration. That type of government has a very rocky road ahead if they don't realize their premises and act accordingly. I hope they soon reach this realization and that the government starts to speak to those parties who want to enhance the welfare state and to have uh, safe housing uh, that people can afford and safe employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next speaker is Eva Bushtour for the Christian Democrats. Mr. Speaker. Winston Churchill should have said, or he said, that what makes a person qualified to have a political uh, political assignment is that they can predict what's going to happen tomorrow, next year, and next decade, and then afterwards explain why it didn't happen, end of quote. We, as Christian Democrats, we do not live up to these uh, demands by Winston Churchill because the predictions that we made almost a year ago about what the January Agreement would lead to, well, unfortunately, they have all become reality. We warned then that the lack of common visions would mean that the political leadership would suffer from lockjaw, that cooperation and compromises would be made more difficult instead of easier, that the January agreement in practice gives small parties, small extremist parties, the right to veto important decisions. This year we've seen how the Green Party has stopped the government from reaching agreements on corruption and gang crime. We also warned that this agreement would prevent constructive non-socialist cooperation in Parliament. And today we see how the Centre Party and the Liberals in, on issue after issue say no to cooperation and no to finding common ways forward because they're referring to the January Agreement. The Liberal parties have, in practice, left the alliance uh, cooperation in Parliament and in our everyday work. We warned that this agreement would lead to a taxation policy that would only benefit those with the highest income but and give nothing to those with low and medium income levels. Now, when the January party's first budget has become reality, um, 
CEO of a major bank has received a tax reduction of 62,300 kroner every month, whereas the nurse, the nursing aide and the police officer, those who take care of us and those who protect us, protect us, they didn't get a single kroner in their wallets. We warned that this agreement would counteract its own purpose, namely to uh, combat the Sweden Democrats, that this party would grow even more. And several uh, opinion organizations today show that the Sweden Democrats uh, are the greatest or the biggest party in Sweden. We warned that if everything was smeared in the br brown color, everything was said to be Sweden democratic policy, we f uh, then, then uh, this would infect the whole Swedish political fields. And we now see how the prime minister is calling the entire opposition blue and brown. And this at the same time as large numbers of patients are waiting to get the care they need. And the government's own research shows that there is a need to build 26,000 more places in elderly care, but there is no plan for that. And there is also a need to introduce new statistics, a new crime category concerning explosions and bombings. This is what the policy, the politics would be about today, to solve uh, the problems we have in society and to safeguard the Swede, Sweden's best interests. The opposition was and is prepared to take responsibility for Sweden on the basis of a shared vision of identity and community that puts people ahead of politics, a government that would uh, know the importance of prioritizing, and that should be the lodestar when you look for corporate cooperation partners. When uh, Stefan Löfven and Isabella Löfven came into office, they were given uh, a boom to administer, but they haven't done that because unemployment is now rising for the six months in a row. So should Sweden be governed by the same red you that wasted the good years? I don't think either the Liberals or the Centre Party believe that at heart. It's not too late to redo this, to reevaluate and to do the right thing. Come back to where you used to belong and give Sweden an alternative. The party that has the that has the, um, um, the Christian Democrats is the party that is a voice for the elderly, for those with functional impairments, for the sick, based on the insight and the uh, good value that people should be placed before politics. And for that reason, we are prepared to give Sweden a new government from this year. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker, Johan Persson from the Liberal Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Liberal Party admires all the brave democracy activists. We've seen them in Hong Kong, Venezuela, in Russia, and recently in Iran men and women who risk their lives when their longing for freedom and democracy is stronger than their fear. We see you, we support you, we admire you. The Liberal Party <coughs> has pushed to ensure that the democracy aid is a more important part of Sweden's foreign policy. Our sister party, the Liberal Democrats in Taiwan, this weekend won a convincing victory in the presidential and parliamentary elections. The democracy activists in Hong Kong have reminded the Taiwanese of the risks of submitting to communist rule. Let the 20s be a decade when we again take decisive steps forward for democracy across the globe. Mr. Speaker, the liberal reforms have both in the 
18th and 19th centuries given people more power over their lives. Many reforms have been resisted from right wing uh, forces, from left wing forces, but they are widely accepted today. This has been a historic truth. It's true for the future. It's about equality reforms, language tests for citizenship, strong Swedish defense, fighting honor related oppression, re establishing the knowledge based schools or relevant punishments for uh, those who are criminals and more police officers, strategically lower taxes for supporting new jobs and new uh, housing that is rented accommodation. Much has been done, but more needs to be done. <laughs> for more than a hundred years, the Liberals have cooperated in Parliament to bring Sweden forward. Political force of action is important. The ability to dust yourself off and start again is equally important, as was necessary when it comes to the ongoing re-regulation of the employment service. What the January agreement doesn't solve or has no intention of solving societal problems, then the Liberals always try to seek cooperations with other parties in the Parliament. So during this decade, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal Party will focus on the biggest challenges. It's about addressing municipal uh, econom economy, regional economy. We talk about the integration debt and counteracting the unsafety that travels in the wake of uh, severe crime. We do not intend to stand on the sidelines and try to outbid the others. We intend to be conservative and see uh, the objective relevant to people. The January Agreement is primarily not a pr product to create uh, tranquility for social democrats who are hungry for power. It's not intended to uh, get the blood pumping for conservative politicians either. It is a tool with which we can govern Sweden after the election in 2018, where the Mr. Mr. Speaker tried several different options. Months uh, passed and Parliament voted no. It is almost the case that those who deny climate change have almost physically been smoked out of their denial bubble by the ongoing disastrous fires in Australia. They will have to face <laughs> what is going on. The Liberal Party will continue to drive transition towards a fossil free society through technology and innovation, not by apportioning uh, blame. It, this is true for Sweden, the EU and across the globe. We want to secure our wealth systems by continuing to enhance the knowledge uh, reforms, uh, raising academic results in Swedish schools that people have a uh, regular contact with a GP and get timely health care. We want more people to have more freedom in their everyday lives. We want to uh, reinvigorate the Swedish judiciary so that more people feel that they're safe and they are given a right a decision when somebody has wronged them. The way ahead is always forged by hard-working people in small, medium-sized and mid to large-sized companies who always work every day in Sweden to create the prosperity that we in this House will try to apportion and allocate uh, to the best of our abilities. Mr. Speaker, we have a blank canvas for Sweden the 19 the two 2020s it that sweden des deserves liberal reform and success thank you the next speaker is isabella levin from the green party you have the floor mr speaker the world is on fire literally speaking the Amazon and Australia are ravaged by fire, and far more than a billion animals have been killed in these fires. In Sweden, the temperature was between three and six centigrade higher than normal now in the month of December. At the same time, discontent and hatred are smoldering between people all over the world, and authoritarian regimes do not hesitate to stoke the fire of hatred in order to consolidate their powers. Erratic men with a finger on the trigger, have taken the whole of humanity hostage. And the democratic rule and the respect for human rights that we thought for a long time was the only and obvious way forward is now being attacked. We see this in the United Nations and we hear this in rhetoric from 
leaders and from countries that have appointed Sweden their target. What Sweden stands for, equality, openness, democracy, and the decisive net and the resolve to leave the dependence on fossil fuels that at present finance some of the least democratic and most authoritarian countries in the world, that makes us a threat to the forces that want to go in the opposite directions. And that's why the troll factories are working against us and why large countries stoop to pointing us out as uh, an example not to be followed. Mr. Speaker, the world is at a breaking point and we need to keep our head cold but our hearts warm. The future doesn't create itself. We create our future here and now. A year ago, the January agreement was entered into between the government, the Centre Party and the Liberals. It's a unique cooperation program, program that bridges ideological differences between parties in the political centre or in the centre of the political spectrum. And it contains a large number of good reforms. Increased pensions, more time for parents to be with their children, more money to the police force, defence and health care, and not least more resources to, bat to fight against uh, mental ill health. Resources to reduce segregation and improve schools, and a broad climate action plan that is unique in the world where we integrate the climate in all policy areas. The January agreement was a message of strength for Swedish democracy to show that a clear majority was not prepared to work with political parties that have their roots in neo-Nazism and white supremacy. However, that we do have a majority that is prepared to take its democratic responsibility in a time of crisis and fires and to stand up for the equal value of all people, for feminism, climate justice, solidarity and openness, and erect a firewall against the forces that want to tear down these values. Mr. Speaker, to build a safer and better world, we need trust and we need a belief in the future and we need leadership based on a long term perspective. For that reason, I regret to find that the uh, reaction of the uh, moderate party and the Christian Democrats to the January agreement has been to undermine what has for so long been the strength of Swedish society, the ability to reach agreements across political blocks. They leave the energy agreement. They betray the promises to the electorate about high-speed trains. They do not want to unite against gang criminality. Instead, they drink coffee and eat lunch together with the Sweden Democrats, which they promised their voters never to do. And they spread consciously an image of Sweden that is collapsing, an image that is welcomed by the forces that want to hurt us. I never thought I would say this. But today, in days like this, I miss Friedrich Reinfeldt, the previous leader of the moderate party, who was least guided by a vision, even if I didn't share his vision. When the world is burning, po po politics must be led by a belief in the future, not be an exercise in finding random conflicts to consolidate power. That is not good for Sweden. It's not good for the trust and confidence of the Swedish people in their elected representatives. It's not good for democracy, and it's not how you put up fires. Thank you. Thank you. That completes the first round of the speeches, and we will proceed with the Prime Minister, Stefan Levin, in the second round. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's good <coughs> that many political parties are now in agreement with us that we need to invest in the welfare. But uh, I am not sure that uh, everyone feels today that we politicians uh, can solve uh, problems in society. And if you feel distrust, if you're disappointed in societal developments, and if you point towards uh, social democracy, and if you start to feel that you have no trust and no faith in uh, politicians, well, I do think that uh, what could be said to be distrust can be seen as expectations, expectations as to what Sweden could 
could be. And I do understand your anger. If you work in the healthcare sector and you see that there are demands on efficiencies that uh, follow one on each other, and at the same time we see that tax money goes to expensive consultants and market solutions, I do understand your anger if you live in the suburbs to big cities where you see drug trades in stairwells. I do understand your anger if you're living in the rural areas of Sweden and you see that uh, societal services are being dismantled. I hear your anger and I share it. And we share the same hopes, the same expectations as to what Sweden can become. And that is why we now need to invest in building a strong society. We need to increase resources for welfare. We have to have pension systems providing safe pensions. We need to manage climate change and we need to fight criminality and the causes of criminality and we also have to have a migration policy that is sustainable. This year is about everyday lives, your care, the futures of our sons and daughters and Sweden has to be able to do more than just solving problems in society. We have to build a strong society, a strong Sweden for everyone. Thank you. Ulf Kristersson from the Bonnery Party, Jimmy Åkesson, Anders V. Jonsson and Jonas Sjönstedt, Eva Börstor and Johan Persson have requested a rejoinder. And the first speaker is Ulf Kristersson. You have the floor. Mr. Speaker, the uh, deconstruction of the Swedish nuclear power is continuing, first Ring Health 2 and now Ring Health 1. Emissions are expected to increase by 8 million tonnes. There are approximately 8 million reasons to rethink that policy. This is not just poor climate policy, but also very poor energy policy, because Swedish industry needs electricity around the clock around the year, not just uh, during a very warm winter. If we are going to manage the climate targets, the projections believe that we need 60% more electricity by 2025. Stefan Levin went along with this argument when he was a trade union leader, when he was open to lifelong extensions of nuclear power. And I'm asking you, Stefan Levin, when did you change your mind and why? Thank you, Prime Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We tried to get a long-term energy agreement, and this was an important objective that industry, trade and industry, be given long-term rules to play with. And I feel that long-term is more than three and a half years. That was the perspective of the moderate party. And when that agreement was concluded, then Vattenfall had already decided to close reactors. They did that for several reasons. The safety standards have been increased since Fukushima, and it partly had to do with safety standards. Secondly, they felt that it made no business sense to continue, and we needed to solve energy policy by looking long term and also to ensure that uh, when we have an agreement, then the market also has to abide by those rules. But the moderate party after, well, you <coughs> felt three and a half years was long term. That is not long term for me. And now we have the biggest surplus ever when it comes to energy in Sweden. Ulf Kristersson. Ulf Kristersson. When, Mr. Speaker, did it become long term to close down a competitive necessary nuclear power installations? Because a single company makes the assessment that they are not um, business like. This fascinating uh, belief in the market forces is impressive. I don't understand why you accept this historic mistake in a situation when electrification of Swedish transport systems and Swedish industry will require more electricity. If it's going to be clean energy, we cannot have confidence in constant wind. It's very obvious that no single country in the world places their entire energy supply uh, on a contract with a single company, a state-owned company that they refuse to control. This afternoon, Prime Minister, you also have the opportunity to take a new and wiser decision. 
Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, nuclear power has played, will play a very important role in our Swedish energy mix. Nuclear power will not disappear, but the company Vattenfall has decided that these two reactors cannot continue to operate for financial and for safety reasons, and we need to take that decision seriously. And that decision was made a year ahead of the agreement being concluded. In our agreement, we had part of, well, improving nuclear power. We agreed <coughs> on that. And now, a few years after that decision made by the company, five years after that, the moderate party says, nah, that was a mistake. And you should have explained this previously in long-term thinking. As a matter of fact, that takes something completely different. And for the energy sector, for trade and industry, we need to think long-term, Mr. Christensen. Thank you. That uh, was the last of that round of rejoinders, and the next speaker is Jimmy Åkesson for the Sweden Democrats. Mr. Speaker, when you listen to Stefan Löfven when he's in the on the rostrum, it's a bit like when someone said, "We are now going to turn the page. We have now entered a new decade." But it's not enough to turn the page. You also need to go from pretty words and speeches to action. In my speech, Mr. Speaker, I said that the government lacks uh, crisis insight completely. And I think that's probably what is the main characteristic of this government, that they pretend to understand the problem, they pretend they are going to do something about the problems, but then they continue on the same track as before. Last year, in 2019, 120,000 residence permits were granted, were granted to people in Sweden. And my question to you, Stefan Levin, is when is this going to stop? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is uh, the government that I lead that has made uh, decisions about uh, migration policy. We did have a policy that was not sustainable. We have redone it, and we have reduced the number of uh, asylum applicants coming to Sweden. And when you talk about 120,000, then you include guest researchers, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, civil engineers, IT designers and those individuals that we need in this country. And what you say, Jimmy Åkesson, what you say to Swedish companies and government agencies is that these individuals should not be allowed into the country. I think this is very unfortunate. And did you really think that this should stop? Should we stop bringing into the country engineers and other individuals that our companies do need? Jimmy Åkesson. Jimmy Åkesson. Mr. Speaker, this is what's been the problem with the integration debate for decades, that they don't, you don't understand that most of the people who come to our country are not engineers or designers, and they don't have uh, the uh, spearheading competence. But most people who come here are in a difficult situation where m many of them end up in a dependence on um, Social Security, and they become the subject of the kind of gang recruitment that Stefan Levin says he wants to combat against. So in many, many different ways, Swedish society is being fragmented, and this is exactly what has happened. And this is the this is exactly uh, the kind of arguments that we hear from Stefan Levin now that has made it impossible to deal with this, that we have ended up in this situation despite the many problems that this irresponsible immigration policy have created. Stefan Levin continues to talk about... Uh, continues to talk about this kind of policy where we allow people to come into our country. We, I don't have any problems with people coming here, but mass immigration has to stop. Well, what uh, the Sweden Democrats is uh, saying, it's very clear, as a matter of fact. First, Jimmy Åkesson asks me when this is to stop with 120,000 residency permits, that that has to stop, he says. And then he says that it's not to, to stop in his next rejoinder. I think this is somewhat odd. And you asked me a question, Jimmy Åkesson. I answered it. You said 
then that's not what I meant. But most of the immigration is actually labor related. We have ensured that we have reduced the number of asylum applicants coming to Sweden. And uh, this is uh, something where s the EU, all of Europe, has to take its part of the responsibility. We cannot take on that responsibility alone, but we also have to ensure that uh, what Swedish companies, what we need to develop Sweden, those individuals <laughs> will have to be allowed to come here, and you cannot stop that, the Sweden Democrats. That was the end of that round of rejoinders, and the floor now goes to Anders W. Johnson. Thank you, Speaker, Mr. Speaker. Three months ago, I was standing here during uh, Prime Minister's questions, uh, and I was talking about one of the major problems in Sweden when it comes to health care and social services, and that's the care uh, for um, the addiction uh, care. We are among the countries that have the greatest mortality among drug addicts, although we don't have all that many drug addicts. And these has political reasons, because we have organized our health care in strange ways where we divide the health care system bet between those with addiction problems and those with without. And we also have a very fragmented system of care. The Centre Party demanded of the government that we do something about this. We must change this so that also one of the most exposed groups in society are given health care worthy of its name. We need political measures to be taken. When I uh, asked the, pr the question last time, the Prime Minister didn't know when this was going to start. So I'm asking you now, when are we going to initiate the work to give this group of people a care that is worthy of its name? Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. To start with, all citizens of the country has to be provided care when they need it. We cannot accept anything else. And that is why we're adding resources to the healthcare system, employ more uh, people. We have 13,000 more employed in the Swedish healthcare system now compared to when we we took up government and the organizational issue and how to change those things. Well, that has to happen in discussions between the parties that have required that we discuss it and the government. And it's actually exactly what and in which government department, I can't give you precise information now. But this question, the question of the Swedish health care for the future, well, Obviously, everyone has to be entitled to, to care, also those who are addicts. And we have made changes, and we need to do more for those individuals because they have just the same rights as everyone else. Thank you, thank you Anders Johnson. Yes, thank you. But, Mr. Speaker, if you call yourself a welfare party, then you have to take care of one of the most exposed groups. And a great deal of what we do uh, is to add resources. But that's not the problem here. The problem is that we have organized the care of these people in a totally absurd way, where those with substance abuse or addiction uh, often also have a somatic or a physical disease. They are both going to be cared for by the health care, but also by the, the, the organization responsible for health care. So we don't need money here. We need structural measures and a change in legislation. We in the Centre Party have ensured that we have a social, um, social affairs committee that is united in this, but we also need action to be taken by the government because hundreds of young people die unnecessarily, so we need initiatives and the government has to step up. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I share that opinion, and I don't think that we have different uh, opinions. As a matter of fact, this is, is something that's even bigger because we have the same types of problems when it comes to elderly care, where we have uh, divisions between the county councils and the municipalities, where they both have uh, responsibilities. And of course, we need to look at this. And I've already said that we made enhancements uh, to the care of uh, substance abusers already last year and we want to continue with other parties, uh, political parties, is to ensure that everyone in this country is entitled to the best possible care. Thank you. Thank you. That was the end of that round of joinders and the next speaker is Jonas Sjöstedt from the Left Party. Mr. Speaker, 
Prime Minister, the welfare crisis is spreading across Sweden. In Eskilstuna, the Social Democrats are reducing the social services and selling municipal properties. In Hudiksvall, uh, 120 jobs are going to go have to go away in schools and preschools. In other uh, towns, it's the schools, the music training, etc. In Ludvika, it's the care for the elderly. That will see significant reductions. And this is what it looks like. And this is because of the government policy and the government budget. If you take it seriously that we are going to give priority to the welfare system, then the government has to make clear what additional resources are being given to the welfare system. It's not enough to talk about it, but the time has come to say exactly how much the regions and the municipalities will give, be given to manage the job. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is something that we've said for a long time, and this is a fact. Last period of <laughs> government office, we added money. And summer 2017, we said very clearly we need even more, and we made promises prior to the elections 2018 that we'll provide another 20 million, and we're doing that now. And then we heard that we have a financing gap, 90 billion for Swedish healthcare, that we need to do more. And then Salar, the Congress for Swedish municipalities and regions, well, they had their Congress in December, I was there, and I said that, that no one will be left behind. We will provide more money. And now the moderate party is uh, saying that they need another $3 billion, and uh, there is an initiative here in the Riksdag. But this is not enough. And uh, the left, you are to now discuss with the, the moderate party, and you also want to uh, remove investment subsidies. And how do you think this will add up, Jonas Sjöstedt? Jonas Sjöstedt. Jonas Sjöstedt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that the Prime Minister talks about the last uh, mandate uh, term where the budget was uh, done together with the left party. Welfare was put first. Now we put uh, lowering taxes to the highest earners first. That's why we have the situation in our municipalities. Then pretty words are not enough and general promises. We need to see action. We need money in the amount of billions to the municipalities and regions. And I share Mr. Prime Minister's vision that three billion is not enough. That's uh, too little. It's a recipe for cutbacks in actual fact. But so far, the Prime Minister has promised zero crowns. Please put your money where your mouth is, Mr. Stefan Duyen. Look at the situation in the municipalities now. They need to be told what's going to happen now. Am I to take it that the Prime Minister is promising a significantly larger allocation to municipalities and regions than the three billion they just condemned as being insufficient uh, proposed by the moderate party? Thank you. Prime Minister, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is exactly what they cannot happen, that you just think that you can, well, raise a finger, test waters and say this is the amount we need, so you say 10, and then... At the same time, Jonas Sjöstedt is now saying that, uh, well, if you do not do something, then I'm going to discuss with those who asked for only three, a third. And also the investment subsidies for apartments will discuss that as well. And you want to do away with additional services. And uh, that was okay, you say. And if you do that, then... It will be very expensive for the municipalities, as a matter of fact. This is good. And this is good with this type of employment, so that we can get uh, newly arrived women into employment. And your suggestions, that is not what you do if you believe in Swedish welfare. We need clear answers for the municipalities, and we need long-term answers. And then you cannot negotiate from the rostrum here in the Riksdag, and you can't say that you're happy with a third of what you originally wanted. You can't, Jonas Sjöstedt. And that concludes that round of rejoinders. Now the floor goes to Ebba Bush Tour from the Christian Democrats. Mr. Speaker. Just before New Year's, reactor two at the Dinghaus nuclear power plant was decommissioned. 
The Christian Democrats have tried to understand for a long time why the fully owned uh, Vattenfall, fully owned by the state, choose to decommission efficient, safe and carbon dioxide free production of electricity ahead of time, at the same time that the demand for electricity and the profitability of production is heavily on the increase. That does not add up. Is the Prime Minister able to explain to this House, can you guarantee to the House that the government that he's been in charge of since 2014 has never exerted any influence to ensure a an advanced decommission of Ringhouse 1 and 2, not through civil officials, not through the back door, not through his pa party or through a coalition party, and not through uh, somebody uh, acting on his instruction. Well, <laughs> thank you. I get the feeling that I'm on trial in court. Well, as a matter of fact, that is the point, Ebba Bush Tour Vattenfall, the company, they make their own decisions, and that decision was made one year ahead of the agreement, so everyone knew. We, however, we improved conditions for nuclear power, we made it cheaper, and then a few years after that, you say, we need to change the decision that was made. And uh, this is not correct, that it's absolutely safe. We need to invest enormous amounts of money to have those reactors up and running, and that was why Vattenfall made a decision that they made. So either we have to have subsidies or we have to have those uh, reactors being operated with energy prices that will be much, much higher for consumers. And I do not think that's a good idea. We need to think long term. Companies have to be allowed to make their decisions. And when did you in the Christian Democrats stop believing in the market economy? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a Christian Democrat, uh, you are in favor of a social um, market economy, and Vattenfall is a state-owned company. Let's talk about money. Unfortunately, there is no public um, reporting on the profits, but you can calculate that the uh, shareholders should have uh, earned about three billion just over the three last years. And then the benefit to the climate or the security of the chain of value that uh, is earned by uh, Ringhals uh, through Vattenfall, that's the point of having a state-owned company. This is what Stefan Nyqvist recently wrote in Dagens Industry, and I quote, if Vattenfall cannot see the economic uh, uh, advantages to continuing to commission Ringhals 1 and 2, it's because um, that they have a fundamentally different view of the electricity market, then they make a different assessment than all the other players and stakeholders in their calculations. I did not hear an answer to my question. Has the Prime Minister, through uh, a minister or an undersecretary, influenced Vattenfall to decommission ahead of time? That question requires an answer. Can you please answer that question? Yeah. Prime Minister, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do think that this is getting kind of silly, with all due respect. We have uh, no government instructions going to our state-owned companies, but we have to respect the decisions made by Vattenfall. I do think they know what they're doing. And uh, when decisions are to be made, they have to decide whether to invest and how to, much to spend. And Christian Democrats, would you like to s have subsidize, uh, subsidies? And then you would also have to start discussions with the EU, because if we're to subsidize Vattenfall, then other companies will want to have subsidies as well. And you have to respect that decision. We have a big surplus when it comes to energy in Sweden today, more than ever before. And we export 25 terawatt hours this year. What we need to do, though, is that we needed to look at the grid, the network and the transmission. And that is where we needed to invest to ensure that uh, the entire country has enough energy. <laughs> And that concludes that round of rejoinders. Uh, we now have a rejoinder from Johan Pash on the Liberal Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, the Liberals also want to linger on this issue of Swedish energy production. The modern society does require for us to increase the production of electricity in our country. And then it's slightly strange to decommission a functioning, functioning Swedish power plant, nuclear power plant, at the same time that we have a very strong Nordic European electricity market. And when we decommission uh, Swedish um, 
power plants, uh, hydropower, nuclear power, also fossil free. And we've discussed the climate quite a bit in this House recently. And therefore, the Liberals feel it's quite important to focus on climate smart energy production. So my question then is, is it possible for the government to consider to have an independent audit of, of, of the uh, conditions. Of course, Vattenfall takes a decision based on the old rules that has uh, organized the market in the way that we see it is at the moment. And then when you have new conditions introduced, then the Swedish parliament has a responsibility for the energy market, for education, for housing market, and so on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Well, thank you. The energy policy aims at ensuring that we have safe access to energy at competitive prices for households and companies alike. And that was why we concluded that agreement. And what the market, well, what has changed for Vattenfall is possibly that they now have better conditions for nuclear power. It's better, it's easier to operate a nuclear power plant today, but they still stick to their decision. And that is because it's safe, not safe enough, and they feel that the investments that would be needed are just too big. We need to focus on where we have a problem, and that is the grid. We have a problem there. We have a big surplus uh, basically every month. I think that we had uh, um, a period, a month or a week, uh, during summer, as a matter of fact, where we had a little bit of a problem. But we do have a surplus, and we now need to ensure that we can transport electricity across the country. Thank you, Johan Fashion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Liberals agree with this, that we need to have a stronger power and a possibility to, to transmit this across of Sweden, to, to develop this. But the idea here that, that, the, that what this means, the, this, this forced closure and decommissioning of Swedish nuclear power means that we will become more dependent on Danish, German and Polish coal power that uh, will come into play when we enter into problems. Because sometimes the wind will not blow, the rain will not fall as it uh, has done uh, before at all times. and. Uh, we cannot store uh, power all the time, and uh, we need to ensure that we look at this from a global perspective. This uh, increases the production of coal power in Denmark, Germany and Poland, and that is detrimental to the climate shared by us all. The Prime Minister, well, thank you. I've already said that we have a surplus throughout the year. We had one month in the year where we needed to import, and we knew, know that we can remedy that. It has to do with how we import, how we export. We do not have a major problem. And as a matter of fact, the month where we needed to import, that was during the summer. It's incorrect to say that we have major problems to such an extent that we're dependent on uh, coal uh, produced electricity from Denmark or Germany, we have never exported as much as we do this year. And that's good, but we do have a problem, and that has to do with the transmission of electricity in the country. And that is what I want to focus on so that we can ensure that we have electricity, that we have power across the country throughout the year at competitive prices. <laughs> And that concludes the round of rejoinders uh, for the Prime Minister's speech. We will now give the floor to Ulf Kristersson from the Moderate Party. And let me also say that I'm very pleased to see so many of you here today to listen to this party leader debate. Uh, welcome to the Swedish Parliament and also a big warm welcome to the representatives of the diplomatic corps that are here today. Mr. Speaker, leading up to the elections 2014, Stefan Levin promised to invest in trade and industry with innovation catapults and with business plans for Sweden, where we are to have in 2020 the lowest unemployment in Europe. I'm not sure that you remember, because this was a while since we heard the Social Democrats talk about that project to promise that we would have the lowest unemployment in the EU. Instead, what we got was the lowest growth in the EU. We have more long-term unemployed now compared to when the when the Social Democrats entered into government, and uh, we see problems with the 
graphics and integration and also with dependencies on grants and subsidies. And it's more difficult today to finance public services. We have uh, municipalities having deficits towards the end of a boom in the economy. But instead of looking at the world, at Sweden, and um, to ask the question, what should we start with? Well, what the government is doing instead is looking at the internal agreements and the thinking about the 73 points in the agreement. They're thinking and discussing about um, uh, study leaves and reductions in subsidies. And they're not really thinking about the police or the judiciary. The situation is serious. We need me more money. We need more priorities, better priorities. And that is why we tomorrow will present a proposal for an extra budget and ensure that we need get money for those things where we need money and uh, this is what Sweden needs. And Stefan Levin knows that in our democracy it is the Riksdag, the parliament, that makes the decisions, not the government. Thank you. We have rejoinders to Ulf Kristersson from Stefan Löfven, Social Democrats, uh, Ulf Kristersson, Mother Party, Jimmy Åkesson, Sweden Democrats, and, and Isabella Löfven from the Green Party. First, uh, we have uh, the Prime Minister from the Social Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, those who have a right to expect something from us politicians are the old age pensioners. They work their whole lives. They deserve respect and financial security. We want higher and fairer pensions. And we've started this work with the January agreement for this year. We raise the floor in the basic uh, retirement uh, pension as well. But we are not uh, satisfied. We need to raise pensions for those who have worked hard throughout their entire professional lives at low wages. And we also need to introduce more money into the pension system so that we can say that we reach our objective, that at least 70 percent of your final pay should be paid out as a pension. We have good work going on in our pensions group, but I think the most important thing to ensure long-term thinking in the pension system is that people know that they receive what they can fairly expect. Higher fair pensions. Uh, is the moderate party willing to contribute to this development? Well, Mr. Speaker, I think this is interesting that the Prime Minister now talks about higher pensions for everyone, but the only thing you did before was to improve pensions for those who already had the highest pensions. We reduced taxes for pensioners, all pensioners, in our proposal so that all pensioners would have more money in their wallets, not to just just those who already had a lot. And we want to do that. We want to reduce uh, taxes for all pensioners in Sweden so that they have more money because they have earned it. <coughs> Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Just for your information, the last mandate term we started to lower taxes for those with the lowest pensions, and we started at that end. Now Mr. Christensen says that certain lowering of taxes will provide better finances for old age pensioners. It's kind of funny to hear that we heard you, you introduce the pensioners' taxes with your deduction on work. This is wrong. This tax should be removed. I wish we could remove it entirely. That was not possible. Um, because you introduced another uh, deduction on, on uh, earnings. But uh, will you contribute to higher pensions, not just introduce tax reforms? Wage earners who worked hard for a whole life, they have received low wages and therefore their pensions are too low. Can we expect better news for this group of people? What do you say from the moderate party? Ulf Christensen. Ulf Christensen. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're in total agreement. We need to improve the situation for the pensioners of the country. But we have real sharp proposals to increase their purchasing power so that they will have more money in their wallets after taxes. And if you want to do something, if you want to do something quickly, then to reduce the taxes for the pensioners in this country, that is the best way to increase their purchasing power. Everything else, anything else would take a lot longer. Otherwise, it would have been done a long time ago. And that concludes that round of rejoinders. Now we have a rejoinder from Anders W. Johnson from the Centre Party.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2019, as we all know, it was a very intense year in Swedish politics, where we started with the January Agreement put in place that provided for Sweden a very much needed liberal agenda for reform. But it was also a year that meant another kind of change in Swedish politics, a complete change to the playing field. Ulf Kristersson and the moderate party opened the door to ideas that they had so clearly rejected previously to collaborate with Jimmy Åkesson and the Sweden <laughs> Democrats. The meeting between the party leaders of the moderate party and the Sweden Democrats and their uh, news that they will collaborate going forward, this gives us a lot of pause for thought. And my honest question to Ulf Kristersson is therefore, what is it that the moderate party wants to achieve with the collaboration with the Sweden Democrats? Is this the first step towards building a new conservative bloc in Swedish politics? Ulf Kristersson. Ulf Christensen. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, deputy party leader for the party who promised leading up to the elections to never, ever have a social democratic government and then helped create it, is now wondering whether something has happened in Swedish politics. Oh, yes, something has happened in Swedish politics. But on a more serious note, each political party makes its own decisions, and I'm not going to talk too much about your decision, but you made a mistake. We could have had a right-wing government with a stable right-wing policy, a policy that you can believe in instead of trying to obstruct. And uh, what has happened is that now I am prepared to talk to all the political parties who have been democratic democratically elected all parties in this chamber to see if we can make a concrete decisions that are good for Sweden. That is what has happened. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is the big difference compared to last autumn when the Centre Party did everything they could to find a broad solution, when the voters did not provide us a mandate for an alliance government. That's because the other parties lost too much. At that situation, we wanted to find a broad agreement where we could keep the uh, alliance together, but also to find an agreement across party lines. This was uh, obstructed, not least by Ulf Christensen's party. We find that values are very important and we think that liberalism is the way forward or to quote Carl Bild. Also in these times of uh, cold winds, liberal ideas and values stand firm. That's where we see hope and at that point you as a politician you have a choice. You can choose to start to collaborate with uh, parties that refer to themselves as being anti-liberal or you can try to find centre solutions. So my question remains, what what is the intention of the moderate party? Is this about creating a new conservative bloc in Swedish politics? Final rejoinder, Ulf Kristersson. Well, when the moderate party, the left, the Christian Democrats and the Sweden Democrats, when they are discussing whether we here today can improve the situation for Swedish municipalities, then that is what it is about. Can we improve the situation for Swedish municipalities? That is what it is about, to discuss specific issues. That is a dimension in Swedish politics that is undervalued today. You were the ones who did not even want to try with an alliance government. I took part in those negotiations. You, however, did not. What happened was that you demanded that the alliance was to stick <coughs> together and form a social democratic government. And we, the moderate party, we did not agree to that. And that concludes this round of rejoinders. Uh, the next rejoinder is Jonas Sjöstedt from the left party. Jonas Schoen, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ulf Kristersson, racism is one of the big problems in Swedish society. Racist organizations and parties uh, often point to Muslims as scapegoats or as a target for their attacks. I'm worried that the moderate party is heading in the same direction. This is specifically clear in the municipalities where they rule together with the Sweden Democrats in Brumela. They've uh, prohibited prayers during working hours. 
in Solvesborg. It's about uh, purchasing books uh, in the students' mother tongues in Stefan's Torp. It's about not serving food that has been slaughtered in such a way that is possible for Muslim street. In Stefan's Torp and Skudup, it's about uh, prohibition against having headscarves in schools. It's probably illegal to even have such a ban. These are placard politics sending a message that the problem really is Muslims. Is that really moderate policies, Ulf Kritzestam? Mr. Speaker, no, this is truly not moderate policy. I agree with you, Nathrösted, that both racism and anti-Semitism are growing problems in Sweden. There are too many people and organizations that openly, not least in social media, spread threats and hatred. And the security police have a pretty good uh, idea about who these people are, illegally uh, and legally as well. I think this is something that we need to take a joint responsibility for, to fight against this. But at the same time, there are other problems in Sweden that other parties shy away from, on a related problems Honor-related violence is such a problem where people take the right to, in the name of honor, oppress women and children in a country where individual values are um, given great uh, value. And I think it, it's good that you pay attention to one side of the problem, but you should pay attention to the other side as well. Jonas Kostet. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honor-related violence should always be combated. Violence and oppression in the name of honor is never acceptable. Anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, these must be combated. I'm happy with your answer and that it was so clear when you expressed this, but I still want to hear your say and your voice in your municipal put politicians when they play along in the political game run by the Sweden Democrats and when decisions are taken on this type of measures in the municipalities with one single purpose to stigmatize and to point fingers at Swedes who have the Muslim faith. We should stand up and safeguard freedom of re religion, equality before the law and people's rights. And that's how we combat racism. Uh, of Christa Sean. Mr. Speaker, basically we agree municipalities should stick to the constitution and they should do what they have been uh, appointed to do and nothing else. I've been a municipal politician myself and they have enough work. But I must say that the question of very young girls wearing a hijab in Sweden is very, very difficult. Freedom of religion is... Uh, something that we have to safeguard, but we also need to ensure the same rights for young uh, people, both boys and girls. So let's uh, take a closer look at this. There may be genuine conflicts of interest that may be difficult to handle, but basically we're in agreement. We must never uh, accept anti-Semitism or racism. And that concludes that round of rejoinders. The next rejoinder is from Johan Passion from the Liberal Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thought as a Liberal it's quite good to talk about our schools and education in a party leader debate. And just uh, as it happened before Christmas, Mr. Speaker, there was a big international survey uh, presented uh, where it has been discussed how to measure development and the future of a country uh, when it comes to academic results in schools. And for the second time in a row, results went up. This is very good. Uh, not least uh, because of the cooperation that we undertook together in the Alliance Government of Kyrgyzstan, where we f created the, f the foundation for the knowledge-based schools with clear focus on rules, etc. But then I have a question for Ulf Kyrgyzstan. When the Moderate Party commented on this development, and now when they continued within the framework of the January Agreement with uh, measures taken for the knowledge-based schools, because that's where it starts, the possibility for change starts at school to create prosperity in a country, then the comment from the Moderate Party was this was a frightening, this was a tragedy, that these results were politically governed. What did you mean by that, that you don't accept the results from the PISA survey. Thank you, Ulf Christensen. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I think that's a misunderstanding. I've commented the PISA study myself and said this is a very good signal. They point to good measures. And I am 100% sure that I spoke about the previous Liberal leader, Ulf, uh, Jan Björklund, and I also pointed out that inequality increases in Swedish schools, that there are major differences between schools that are not acceptable, that there were also many children who couldn't take part in the test because they didn't know enough Swedish, and that this is a problem. I think it's a good idea to be able to think about two things at the same time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I struggle with thinking about two things at the same time, but, um, well, yes, it's good. Uh, equal opportunity. Uh, and then that should uh, supersede uh, municipalization of, of Swedish schools. I remember when I was head of the student council and I demonstrated with thousands of, of students in Örebro, we were against this, making them uh, municipal. We, we were against this. We identified this as a problem. Um, so we want uh, responsibility for schools to be held by the state, to have a greater equality, because we know that since it w the responsibility was put to the municipalities, this equality has reduced. Um, and at this point, is it possible for the moderate party to consider supporting uh, this work driven by the Liberal Party? Because it's very important to ensure that children are given the same opportunities in Laxo as in Landskrona. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also believe that the municipalization of Swedish schools is not the best reform that's been carried out. Uh, in Sweden in modern times. However, I don't think that our main task now is yet another gigantic organizational change where we re-nationalize uh, schools. One or two municipal uh, politicians may say that, uh, well, the system doesn't isn't without faults, but I don't think that's where the responsibility lies. But I think the government needs to take race greater responsibility for equal opportunities and equality for a quality-based school and never accept uh, independent schools that do not provide the education that the children need. The government must take action then. And that was the end of that round of rejoinders. And the next speaker is Isabella Levine. You have the floor. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, agreements across party lines have been good for Sweden. It's provided stability across mandate terms. It provides security on issues like pensions, the defence, energy supply. Of course, not all parties get exactly what they want in these negotiations. It's about placing the best interests of the country uh, ahead of the party's interests. Unfortunately, the moderate party are <coughs> failing these issues. They've left the energy agreement. They've taken a different stance on high-speed trains. They've said no to negotiate across party lines, and this is very regrettable. Ulf Kristersson, municipalities, regions, and companies in all of Sweden have shaken hands with Sweden to uh, build the train uh, rail uh, grid and new housing in the Sweden negotiations, uh, commenced by the Alliance uh, government on high speed trains. Why is that? promise to all the municipal regions and companies not important more important to you than your sudden desire to oppose something that the government is in favor of Ulf Christensen no Mr Speaker it's not a sudden desire to be against what the government is for, but rather a very clear will to focus on the major problems and solve those problems, not to stick to uh, an agreement with others that do not, does not solve the problems. The broad agreements are good if they solve problems, otherwise they are but an illusion. And for that reason, it was stupid to stick to the high-speed trains when the major investment needs are in other forms of infrastructure. That's why it would have been stupid to stick to the uh, gang criminality discussions and not do what we do now. And that's why it would have been stupid to stick to an energy agreement that does not guarantee that we have electricity in the places where it's needed. So I believe in factual politics and to, to solve problems than to just have a formal agreement that the government can be happy with.
Isabella Levin. Isabella Levin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, handshake is a handshake. It doesn't matter if it takes place here in the parliament or in uh, at a kitchen table. This is the fact. Sweden's population has grown. More people want to travel by train. We need new railway networks. If the question isn't do we need to build new railway networks? The question is, should we build them with old, uh, obsolete technology, or should we build them with fast technology that is building for the future when we can connect Sweden, Gothenburg and Malmö, so you can reach them within a matter of hours? You knew this when you were a minister in the Alliance government. You took a stance in favour of this then, but that is apparently no longer true. So then I wonder, honestly, considering this change of direction, change of course in moderate policies, if the moderate party in the future are again in a government position. You're talking about extraordinary elections now supported by the Sweden Democrats, but will you in that position not again see the value in agreements across party lines on investments in infrastructure of historic importance to Sweden? Final reply, Ulf Kristersson. Well, the answer, Mr. Speaker, is a crystal clear yes if these agreements solve the problems that Sweden has. It's perfectly clear. Political agreements are not uh, a poker game. It's not a way to guarantee the power for parties that want to be in power, but it's a question of solving practical problems. I'm going to give you two examples. S clear values about what is correct, and then also political pragmatism to see the problem, understand the problem, solve the problem with pragmatic solutions, so that those who are more or less in agreement can shake hands and unite in solving a concrete problem. That, to me, is real politics and does not uh, intend to, uh, to give the January agreement parties power in Sweden forever. That's not my objective. <laughs> And that concludes the round of rejoinders to Ulf Kristersson's address. We now have an address from Jimmy Åkesson from the Sweden Democrats. Mr. Speaker, the government lacks a crisis insight and the government lacks also lacks self-criticism. The problems and the failure we today witness in area after area, country being pulled apart at uh, increasing speed, municipalities that are struggling, the spread of violence that creeps ever closer to more people's everyday lives in our country. These are not problems that came about in a vacuum or came out of thin air or grew like mushrooms from the earth. These are problems that have been created through political decisions and political priorities. And it <coughs> is political decisions and priorities that very much so, very much so, fall back to Stefan Levien and the Social Dem Democratic Party for decades and decades. Not least, migration policies without assuming responsibility, no demands posed in integration policies. I would claim that these are the main reasons for the state that Sweden is in today. And when you listen to the debate, you might get the impression that the government has understood this by now. Uh, we will tighten uh, our policies. We will redirect our focus in migration policies. They say, but still it continues, 120,000 residence permits in 2019. Yes, sure, some of these are for people who add quite a bit to our country. And that has been what migration policy has been for decades. There are some people arrive who bring things with them that we need, but there will also be lots of people coming who will not bring with them anything that we need, and that is the problem we have. What about, Mr. Speaker, if we had migration policies where people who arrived in Sweden had an ability, a possibility to contribute to our country? Wouldn't that be amazing? Thank you. Prime Minister Stefan Löfven, Anders W. Johnson, and Jonas Sjöstedt and Isabella Löfven have requested rejoined us, as has Anders W. Johnson, uh, Johan Persson from the Liberals. Prime Minister, you have the floor.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, I'm very proud of what social democracy has achieved over the decades in order to create one of the best welfare countries in the world. And many other countries are looking at Sweden as an example. During the past mandate period, we added 35 billion in welfare money. And the Sweden Democrats said no to that. They're not needed, they said. And we also said that we wanted to do away with the surplus objective because we realized that we needed more money for welfare. We ne negotiated so there would be only a third left. The Sweden Democrats said no to all of it, less money to welfare. The Sweden Democrats want uh, 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 stay-at-home uh, contribution to uh, mothers, which would make sure that uh, women, especially immigrant women, would not get out onto the labor market. They also wanted to reduce language training, which would prevent newcomers from uh, getting a job. And this means that the Sweden Democrats has no uh, credibility whatsoever when it comes to welfare. I, I Mr. Speaker, in the budget that we uh, adopted not very long ago, um, there was some money allocated extra to municipalities. Not at all sufficient. The budget we wanted included much more money being allocated to municipalities, as much money as the uh, municipalities and regions of Sweden have said that they need to maintain their welfare systems at the level they're at today. So it is the Sweden Democrats who put forward policies that mean that municipalities can keep up welfare efforts. It is uh, the social uh, Democrats uh, supported by the other parties that continue to ensure that municipalities struggle, that they need to uh, make uh, cutbacks and uh, reduce jobs. This is what the so Social Democrats are doing today in Sweden in 2020, not the Sweden Democrats. Prime Minister. It was the Social Democrats that added 35 billion kroner to the Swedish welfare sector, 100,000 more jobs, and the Sweden Democrats were against this. We've never, you've never been a welfare party, and now you're saying you want to give more money to the municipalities. But then again, you're going to have uh, a, an absolute end date for being um, uh, f for sickness benefits, which means that more people will be dependent on income support. You are now saying no to. Uh, uh, language training for people who arrive as newcomers to the country. So where will these people end up? Well, they will be in the social services office in the municipalities because they need to be supported in some way. This is a toxic cocktail that you are giving us. The, you say that you want to allocate more resources, but you also make sure that the municipalities will have greater expenses and we will end up with a more fragmented country as well. Final rejoinder, Jimmy Åkesson. Well, Mr. Speaker, if you just stop and think about what Stefan Levin just said uh, for a second, uh, divided country with uh, our uh, politics. Haven't you seen what the situation is today? Haven't you seen how divided our society has become the last few decades because of the politics that you have conducted, that you're bragging about, the Social Democrats and Stefan Levin, you caused these divisions, the policies that you have decided on. That is why we have these divisions, why the municipalities do not have the resources necessary to maintain the welfare system. And it's not enough to maintain it, as a matter of fact. It needs to be developed. We have among the highest taxes in the world, and we should have a better welfare system than we have today. But the Social Democrats, together with other political parties in this chamber, you have prioritized mass immigration from all parts of the world instead of welfare. That concludes this round of rejoinders, and the next speaker is Anders W. Johnson for the Centre Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The most important question today in the world is the climate issue, and I would like to uh, hear from the Sweden Democrats about your view. A couple of years ago, you put quote marks around climate change in your own budget, and the climate policy spokesperson Martin Kinnunen says that it's not a question of a climate crisis. The climate is not something that human beings can understand, and we don't know what effects the carbon dioxide 
worldwide emissions have on the climate. Another party representative, Bjorn Söder, said recently that the climate threat is exaggerated. There is no scientific agreement about this problem, and you don't know what this depends on. So my question to Jimmy Åkesson and the Sweden Democrats is the following. Do you still believe that the Paris Agreement is a jippo, that the climate uh, threat is exaggerated, and that there is no scientific agreement about how the what the carbon dioxide level does about the climate. The <laughs> Jimmy Okerson. Well, Mr. Speaker, climate change is ongoing. Most likely, this is due to human impact. That that's a big contributor. There's no doubt. As a matter of fact, I would say these. This is what we hear from the scientists, and they're pretty much in agreement. The debate, however, is totally unplausible. I do not agree in what is being said. There is no scientific evidence saying that the world will end 10 years from today, but that is what we read in papers today. And I think that is bad. That is bad for good policy decisions relating to climate. I don't think it's good to stand here or elsewhere and talk about climate policy as uh, something that means that the world will collapse, because that is not the case. We can, we will solve this situation with efficient solutions, technological advances, etc. We will not solve the situation by scaring people. Anders Johnson. Anders Johnson. Well, it's still it's surprising to hear uh, the party leader of the Sweden Democrats when it comes to these issues. This has to be solved internationally, but the Paris Agreement is stupid. Leading representatives of the party say we don't know what why this has happened, and the party leader himself is standing here saying that there is no emergency and that we don't need to take action here and now. This is one of the greatest threats against human survival. Whether it's going to take 10 years or more, that is another question, but we need to take action. And still, the representative of the Sweden Democrats, time and again, they appear as climate denials in deniers in the political debates, it would be appropriate for the Sweden Democrats to say this is a problem and this has to be, uh, action has to be taken against this. And we sh need to see an end to this double standards by the Sweden Democrats when it comes to the climate issue. Replik, Jimmy Åkesson. Final rejoinder, Jimmy Åkesson. There are no double standards, Mr. Speaker. It's about the fact that uh, Anders Jonsson is uh, looking for things that he can interpret as something that he can blame me for in this uh, situation. I've never said uh, that about the Paris Agreement. What I've said is that it was a poor decision that was made here in the Riksdag. We uh, decided to join the Paris Agreement without knowing what it would mean. We didn't. Those decisions were made at the EU level. And that means that we now have to take responsibility for the emissions from Poland and Bulgaria, and that is totally unreasonable. We need a little bit of balance and common sense in this debate. I think that would be good for the debate as such and also for the climate as such. Later today, we are going to discuss in this uh, chamber the continuation of Swedish nuclear power, and I think you should uh, take your responsibility there, the Centre Party. Uh, that concludes uh, this round of rejoinders, and uh, the next rejoinder will be delivered by Jonas Sjöstedt from the Left Party. Mr. Speaker, Jimmy Åkesson, I'm going to go to your uh, own municipality next week, Sölvesborg, and you usually talk about your municipality as a stage for good policy. I'm going to visit a home for the elderly, which is going to be closed down despite protests from relations. And instead, they, you have made sure that Frösunda will take over care for the elderly in the municipality. And they are known for everything from erroneous medication to 
uh, bad care. So there will be no longer be cooked food in this home for the elderly. There will be industrial uh, cooking. Uh, there will also be demands that the employers should uh, uh, get further training in their spare time. And why is it so important for the speed Sweden Democrats to give tax money to companies like Frösunda, which has already made a bad example of itself in many other municipalities? Well, Mr. Speaker, I don't think that is important for me to give money to companies. What it is about is getting operations that are as good, as efficient as possible. And... Uh, you now pretend that you know everything about these uh, decisions, which is not the case. What it is about is to improve the situation. Of course, we want to improve the care services for those who need care. That is the idea. But the left party, as a matter of fact, you believe usually in the possibilities with politics, and I do as well. The, my municipality where I live, of course, that will not happen what you talk about. I believe in and trust the political majority that we have in our municipality, and I do think that things will turn out great. Mr. Speaker, the whole business idea of Fresunda is to have as few employees as possible and as low cost as possible in order to put tax money in their own pockets instead of looking after the old people they are supposed to look after. But if you can promise, Jimmy Okerson, that Sjösunda in Sölvesborg will be a shining example also in the future, can you promise that the food will be cooked in uh, on site instead of industrial food? Can you promise that the employees will be given full-time jobs instead of part-time jobs? Can you also promise that you will not just have two people per ten uh, elderly people? Because this is what uh, people they have been formed about will happen. If you can promise all these things, that will be very, very welcome. A final rejoinder. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure this is the right time and place for those types of uh, promises. And uh, I'm looking forward to your visit in amazing Sölvesborg next week. You should also then take the opportunity to talk to the local politicians who are in charge of this and also talk to, for example, the chairman of uh, that committee in uh, charge of care, care of the elderly. And uh, that person will be able to answer all your questions. I cannot do this here in the parliament. But uh, we do know that uh, your party is the party who is against uh, entrepreneurship. So I'm not, uh, not surprised that Jonas Sjöstedt is the one talking about these privately owned companies as crooks and villains. And I'm sure that there are shortcom uh, shortcomings in this particular company as well. But uh, there are shortcomings also in uh, operations that are run by the municipality. But... Needless to say, the idea with this is to make things as good as possible. And some might think that it's good, while others think that it's bad. We'll have to wait and see. That concludes this round of rejoinders. And the floor now goes to Johan Persson from the Liberals. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I thought I'll uh, carry on with the climate Question. Well, I actually continue with a lot of things if I get the chance. The climate threat is for real. We just had a discussion, uh, and Jimmy Okerson finally ag agrees that this is a problem. It's a challenge that the Sweden Democrats take seriously, which makes me happy. It's a good thing that the Sweden Democrats uh, also now agree that Sweden should have a strong fossil free and carbon dioxide free energy production so that we can uh, export to other countries and reduce um, uh, coal fired power plants in our neighboring countries. But how are we going to look at the collaboration? The Sweden Democrats are against us working this in uh, OECD, the EU, and uh, the Global Forum, which are important arenas for us. So what are you going to do concretely to do something about the climate threat? Jimmy Åkesson, well, <laughs> that is a description of reality uh, that is not uh, correct at all. 
when it comes to global environmental problems? Well, I think it's an excellent idea to collaborate on the international arena. And uh, I understand that you haven't really read our budget proposal. I don't think you will. But if you had read it properly, you would see that, uh, well, we have a research reactor, for example, for the fourth generation nuclear power. And here we very much want to collaborate in the European collaborations and also provide money for that. And that is the budget proposal we have. And uh, that is what I think we should do. We should collaborate with other countries to get those uh, successes to reach those shared objectives. That is important and nuclear power well, here I have to admit that the Liberal Party, together with us uh, throughout the years that we've been in Parliament, you've been very clear when it comes to the continuation of nuclear power, and that makes me happy. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Speaker. I note that there is one uh, field in EU policy that the Sweden Democrats are in favour of, and that's the research into energy. It's important that we strengthen the energy union because together we have a responsibility for our future in this part of the world. Globally, many other countries need to do the right thing as well, but we need to be uh, we need to reach a zero emission uh, situation as soon as possible. Of course, it's important what they do in China, which Amy Orkerson usually points out, but we have to ensure that we are the best in our part of the world. And then international agreements are uh, an important common tool. So it's uh, regrettable to hear. Now, Jim Okerson says that the Paris Agreement is a good thing, but the Sweden Democrats have many representatives who deny that there is a climate crisis, who say that there's no, there are no fires in Australia. But it's important that the Sweden Democrats now agree that we should work in international organizations, not least the European Union, to um, ensure our energy supply. Jimmy Åkesson. Well, Mr. Speaker, let me just be clear. I do think that there are fires in Australia. I do. But that's not the problem. This is not the problem that we need to collaborate on a global level to reduce emissions. We've already touched upon this, that it is important that we here and now reach uh, zero emissions, you say. But as a matter of fact, that is not important that Sweden reaches the zero emission levels from a global perspective. That is not important because that would cost us a lot to, to get down to zero. And that cost is so gigantic. So those amounts would be much more useful in international investments, international efforts to improve the situation, not just to focus on getting to zero emission level. In Sweden, you have to understand, you have to understand that that would be a total waste to just bring us down to zero when we have other countries doing what they're doing. And that is where we have to spend resources. And that concludes uh, the round of rejoinders. Sorry, no, we. This particular round of rejoinders was concluded, but Isabella Levine has also requested a rejoinder. You have the floor, Ms. Levine. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The escalation of the past few weeks in the Middle East makes the world situation ever more unclear. In this region, there is oil, which is an historical, historically uh, strong source of conflict and war. Well, we in the Green Party are working to ensure that we replace oil and gas and fossil fuels. Uh, that shouldn't surprise anyone. But it's more surprising that the Sweden Democrats, uh, what, which causes a nationalist party, invest so much f f time and effort to make sure that we are not self-sufficient when it comes to uh, to fuel for our cars. How come that you are spending a lot of money on reduced taxation on petrol, which could money that could go to Swedish interest? And uh, instead, you benefit oil-producing dictatorships. How can you explain that? 
Madam Speaker, Sweden is a long country with vast distances, and if people here cannot drive their cars, then our economy, the welfare, our living standard, well, all of that will deteriorate. And if people were to start to sail when crossing borders instead of flying, then the entire world economy would be negatively impacted, very much so. And that is what you need to remember when thinking about this and deciding on what political decisions that are reasonable. Is it reasonable for Sweden with our vast distances, this long country? Is it reasonable that we make it more difficult for ordinary people, more expensive for ordinary people to move, to get to work, to school or to wherever you need to go? Is that reasonable to have political decisions in that direction? I want to say no, and you say yes, and the Environment Party, the Green Party. Thank you, Isabella Levine. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What the Sweden Democrats do is to make sure that the Swedish population gets stuck in dependence on oil from dictatorships, which means that we are entirely dependent on what happens in the Middle East, whether the pet price of petrol will go up or down. In Sweden, we have the possibility to benefit our countryside and produce our own biofuels. We are not going to put a halt to transport in Sweden, but we are going to provide alternatives. Oil provides power, but it also contributes to the climate crisis. The day before yesterday, the cherry trees in Stockholm were in bloom. This is Stockholm and Sweden that is disappearing in the midst of this climate crisis. Why do the Sweden Democrats subsidize economic interests that benefit from destroying the planet? And why, Jimmy Orkesson, don't you want to cut the umbilical cord to the oil interests in Russia? Jimmy Orkesson, you have the floor. Mr. S Madam Speaker, Sweden is not about to collapse just because we have uh, um, flowers blooming in the parks of Stockholm. And uh, if anyone benefits from cars being driven around Sweden, well, if anyone benefits, it's uh, the Swedish state, the Swedish government, because two-thirds of that money actually goes to the government, money that can then be spent on different types of activities within the framework of the budget that we decide on here in the Riksdag. I would be very happy if we, in the longer, shorter term, could uh, be totally independent of these states uh, across the world. Uh, and I want to do that by extending nuclear power so that we do not need to import fossil-based fuels from other countries. But the, the policy of uh, the Green Party, it's far removed from reality and it penalizes the ordinary people. Thank you very much. That concludes all uh, rounds of rejoinders. And now we will have an address from Andreas W. Jonsson from the Center Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What are central aspects to a good and safe life to many of us, family and our home life. For very many uh, people, this is the complete opposite. In 2018, 22 women were murdered by their partners. Seven out of the 10 women murdered in Sweden in 2018 were murdered by their partner. In spite of this, men's violence against women is an issue that we very rarely discuss seriously. This can no longer go on. Said the Centre Party is an active voice for change. We have driven change to ensure that the women's shelters in the country have more long-term financing and funding. We've taken part in funding efforts against domestic violence, honor-related violence and oppression, but so much more needs to be done. We want to see stiffer sentences for gross violation of the integrity of the woman to raise both the minimum and maximum pen penalties. The maximum penalties should be in line with or just above the maximum penalty 
penalty for uh, exceptionally gross assault today, which is basically the type of offence we're dealing with here. We also want to change legislation that uh, stipulates custody of children in domestic violence relationships. We want the custodian that intentionally killed or subjected the other parent for to deathly violence uh, automatically loses custody. Also, we want to have controlling behaviour in close relationships illegal. This would grant women a, a possibility of exiting a destructive relationship before it's too late. These three proposals would be important steps ahead in the efforts of stopping men's violence against women and giving more women their safety and security back. Anders and thank you. And the following, Ebba Buskrul, Jonas Sjöstedt, have asked for rejoinders. And we will continue start with Jonas Sjöstedt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Anders Jonsson, I worked with Assembly at Volvo during the 90s, and the 90s crisis hit us hard, and many people were given notice, and that included me. Later on, I came back to the workplace. And that this was a difficult time, but I feel felt safe and secure in knowing that the trade union could negotiate on my behalf, uh, and uh, that uh, the company could just. Uh, not to do away with the person who had worked for the trade union movement, but the things had to be done in proper order, first in, first out, that there were negotiations with give and take. That's a system that has worked well, and it is a protection against arbitrary um, 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 arbitrary notices. And why do you want to do away with that system so that we bring into the Swedish system that arbitrariness? Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the question. This kind of demonstrates uh, the difference in view of uh, workplace security. For us, security is having a job at a successful company that can compete on a global market that can ensure that you actually have a job to go to. And also security is being able to ensure that the day you want to leave your job, you should be able to go to another job and you should have security in between of jobs. The problem we have in Sweden is that we have built walls that are far too high between those who have a job and those who haven't got a job. And that is one of the primary reasons for the lack of inclusion we have, where more and more people move further and further away from the labour market because these walls are much too high. In the January agreement, we've taken an important step in ensuring that the negotiations have started up between the trade unions and employers to see how we can increase flexibility in the Swedish labour market, and we're proud of this. Jonas Sjöstedt. Madam Speaker, uh, what uh, Anders Johnson uh, says, uh, well, uh, that is uh, not uh, correct. There is no such link between increasing unemployment and the fact that uh, employers can deviate from those rules about in what order to give notice. What you will accomplish with your proposal is that we'll have arbitrariness. If a boss uh, is unhappy with a specific employee, he can just do away with that employee, someone who's been working for a long time, who should be entitled to a good pension, but instead will be sent into the streets with knowledge that he or she will not be able to find a new job. And uh, what will happen is that we'll have people feel unsafe in their workplaces. That is the only thing that this will lead to. It's also no security for those who are outside the labour market, because you want to dismantle that system as well. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is not about dismantling employment security. This is about uh, introducing possibilities to also take skills into consideration in a situation where you, as an employer, have to reduce your number of employees. If you go to Swedish uh, small companies, as I do, I go out and visit them, we know that this is one of the main reasons that the small business owner does not dare take the step to hire one more employee. And if we really seriously 
actually want to combat unemployment, not least with the people the furthest removed from the labor market, then we need to ensure that Swedish small companies, because that's where we see an uh, increase in employment, that they dare to take this step. And then it is very decisive that we change this approach. And I'm happy that this is part of the January agreement so that we can finally address this issue. The uh, thank you. That concludes that set of rejoinders. And we continue with uh, Ebba Bush tour from the Christian Democrats. Madam Speaker, before the January agreement, the Centre Party had the slogan, a new leadership for Sweden. And Annie Lööf criticized Stefan Levin for having a lack of leadership and said that uh, he just uh, talked with nice fluffy words instead of using leadership. And also said that his view on rural areas was kind of odd and that he was stuck in a big city thinking. And she said that Stefan Levin had forgotten about solidarity with those who are marginalized, that it was uh, a party for those uh, in power, that uh, the election campaign was dirty and uh, then uh, asked uh, Stefan Levin to resign. So my question for Anders Jonsson is, what do you think about uh, Stefan Levin's uh, leadership? Is it wanting? Is it hostile towards uh, rural areas? Uh, uh, fluffy, dirty, or how would you describe the Prime Minister's leadership today? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, the case is what we said in the election was to have an alliance government after the last general election. Unfortunately, the voters did not give us a basis on which to do this. We think an alliance government would have been the best thing for Sweden. But at that situation that we had, to us it was important to find another way ahead, uh, as opposed to the destructive cooperation we had during the last term where the government relied on the left party. We succeeded in doing this by uh, entering into the January agreement that has a very strong agenda for reform, where we have proposals to uh, enhance the Swedish rural areas, to uh, proposals on the housing market, to reform the labor market. A lot of our health care policies from the Alliance Corporation is on the list of uh, reforms to be implemented. We've managed to achieve uh, change to actually implement the assistance reform that is very important to us. So the agenda for reform with 73 points and the budget collaboration will make the differences very different to the situation we had during the last term. Thank you, Ebba Bush Thor. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. I still haven't received a reply. How would you, the Centre Party today, describe the leadership of the Prime Minister Stefan Levin? Many of the components that you talk about, uh, they are laudable, and uh, I do think that it's good that you have them in the agreement. Some of these things, as a matter of fact, we uh, were for in uh, the negotiations leading up to the agreement. So that is positive. But if we look at the complete picture, it's uh, problematic. And, uh, those words were kind of harsh, lack of leadership, uh, hostile towards rural areas, uh, just to focus on power, unsolidaric, dirty. So has this changed? And what would you say today when it comes to Stefan Levin's leadership? Thank you very much. Final rejoinder, Anders W. Johnson. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. There's a considerable difference between the government that was in power between 2014 and 2018, when the government was supported by the left party to introduce very large lowering of taxes on uh, raising of taxes on on uh, business and uh, employment, where they dismantled the uh, personal care assistance reform, and queues were doubled within the psychiatric services for child, children and young people were almost tripled. There is the big difference compared to the government in power today, because today they are collaborating with the Centre Party and the Liberal Party. We have a liberal agenda for reform, and uh, a lot of policies that were driven by the Alliance parties before are now to be implemented, and that means that there is a difference between this government and the government in power between 2014 and 2018. The difference is very big, not least when it comes to the political issues, and I am very proud of this, and the Centre Party is very proud of this, because Sweden needs more liberal reform. Uh, thank you. That concludes those sets of rejoinders. And we'll uh, continue with the next uh, speaker. And uh, that is Jonas Hjöstvedt from the Left Party. Uh, 
thank you, Madam Speaker, <laughs> members of Parliament, uh, guests in Australia. We have uh, bush uh, fires. We have people escaping, running for their lives, and uh, the link to climate change is obvious, with heat records being beaten one after another. Agricultural areas in Australia will soon be unable to be used, and uh, this is more and more desert, and we see more and more species in the oceans outside of Australia disappearing, and that is uh, the climate crisis. What it looks like, it's here. We see it now, and the focus because the focal point is Australia. But in Australia, we also see the climate deniers, who they are, what they say, how they tick. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, is in the hands of the coal industry in Australia, and he has been among those who have been sarcastic, pretty much like Jimmy Aukesson in this chamber, uh, being sarcastic towards those who take climate change seriously and want to do something. He, he went to Hawaii on vacation during these uh, times of fire, and then he tried to go visit those areas, but the citizens there were furious and forced him to leave because they demand uh, him to take responsibility together with the coal companies. But we have the same type of climate deniers here among the Social Democrats and also to a certain extent among the moderate party. But now everyone needs to take his or her responsibility. We have very few climate deniers among the red-green. Uh, Swedish television has talked about Greta Thunberg as a left-wing populist. Uh, that was a journalist saying that. And that is says something about our day and age. Her main message, the only message she has really is that we're to listen to science. And if listening to science means that uh, you're a left-wing populist, then that is evidence that uh, the climate needs much, much more than day. Thank you. We have rejoinders from Anders W. Jonsson and Johan Passion from the Liberal Party. We give the floor to Anders W. Jonsson from the Centre Party first for a rejoinder. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Over the last mandate term, we often saw Jonas Sjöstedt speak here from the rostrum and talk about his uh, big influence on Swedish politics. It was during that term that the personal care assistance reform was gradually dismantled. That was when the queues in health care doubled with children and youth psychiatric services, uh, tripled, and we could see how the labour market worked worse and worse. Few employers could turn to the government and get help in finding new employees. Very few of the unemployed uh, could get support from the employment service. We had 100,000 available jobs. We had thousands of unemployed, and the employment service couldn't match the unemployed with the jobs. The criticism was very strong from all all the direction. So my question for Jonas was that when it comes to his involvement with these issues in the weeks before Christmas, what issues did Jonas Kvarstedt and the left party drive over the four years when you shared power to ensure that these systems worked better? Well, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Andrew Johnson is a courageous man. I almost uh, admire you. You come here to the chamber and you talk about unemployment, uh, being a member of the Centre Party. Oh, um, after what you've said, that everything is to be privatised, and after that big chaos that erupts, and we see jobs uh, disappearing in different uh, areas, different municipalities, and then you have those local politicians there, and that chaos caused by privatisation, and no one, not even your party friends, thinks that this is a good situation. So you're quite brave uh, stepping up here saying this, because we see that uh, the employment service today, they can't manage the task, they can't answer the phones, people leave, and uh, now you say that, well, we should have uh, had bigger access <laughs> to training, etc., but this complete chaos that you, the Centre Party, has uh, caused, what you're doing is quite brave. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. The reason that the reform of the employment service being so important is that for a very long time it has been working poorly. 100,000 available jobs and at the same time what, and hundreds and thousands of unemployed people who cannot get helped by them. Employers who do not get support. At that point, reforming the employment service is absolutely necessary. And there are many ways of doing that. What you are criticizing now, Mr. Kerstad, is the uh, budget with lots of cutbacks introduced by um, the Moderate Party and Christian Democrat. You're very happy to work together with them. And you also <laughs> made sure in the spending authorization that these uh, possibilities will be granted. But the question remains, what is your proposal in order to ensure that the employment service that is evidently working poorly will work better? You were able to have influence on this over 2000 2014 to 2018. What did you do? The problems existed already at that time. Jonas Hofer, that final rejoinder. Well, what is important is that we have more chances for occupational training, that we do not privatize uh, employment services, but the employment services have to have the skills, competences necessary, and we have to have employment services available across the country, and they need to be able also to work within the integration area. And th these are some of our comments. We have been we have forced you, we have forced you, the January Agreement parties, to take a step back. And now that chaotic privatization is to be reviewed so that we know what we're doing before we're doing. And I think that is reasonable uh, within politics. And now you talk about additional resources. The Centre Party all of a sudden is where the Social Democratic Party was last uh, period in government. And uh, you try to get credit for what is being done. Thank you very much. That concludes the round of rejoinders. The next rejoinder is from Yuan Passion from the Liberal Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, the left party behaves strongly. It's no secret that after the election there are 182 mandates uh, together. If you join forces, the left party, the Sweden Democrats and the moderate party, the January agreement was put in place so that we would manage this situation so that the left party could not be granted influence over the development because we believe that Sweden is in need of important liberal reforms. And over the years I've noted that the left party aren't exactly advocating these, uh, to put it mildly. And now that these agreement has been delivered, it's not perfect, and no negotiated agreement is ever perfect, but we move forward, as Sweden has done for very many years, against the wishes of the left party. But what is the left party intending to do? Well, I heard a talk of extraordinary elections before. Would the left party participate in those elections in that case? It would be very interesting to hear your strategy, Mr. Hoy that for the coming years in this house. Uh, Jonas Hofstad, well, if there is an extraordinary election, we will participate, I can promise you that. But uh, seriously speaking, we do not want an extraordinary election. We do not want a new government. We ensured that we had this government. It seems like you've forgotten. What we want to do is to change the politics that conducted by uh, this uh, government that is too right-wing. We want to stop the privatizations. We need more money for welfare, and we're not going to satis be satisfied with the fussy answers that we're given today, and we're not going to accept the fact that you ruin employment security for millions of Swedish wage earners. We're going to stop this, and these are some of the things that we've been made very, very clear. There will be more, but I can't tell you everything now. And uh, if the government will not realize uh, that uh, this is uh, necessary, well, the January agreement is just an agreement, and they have to understand that this will lead to big problems. The government has to understand that, and all these plans to destroy employment security, for example, will have to be withdrawn. Talk. Thank you. Johan Pasch on the Liberal Party. Madam Speaker, well, yes, it's a privilege to be a member of Parliament, to uh, be somebody who represents people, to modernise, to develop a Sweden and to exchange ideas in this exciting way with, amongst others, the Left Party, who have a view of the Swedish labour market, not least of Swedish <coughs> companies, that I find frightening. I just heard when Jonas Kostets discussed with Jimmy Orkesson where he just poured out his hatred 
hundred of entrepreneurs in the welfare sector who provide such important services to people, uh, also funded through our tax system. But it is also the case that this requires that the left party uh, dis comes to an agreement with the moderate party and the Sweden Democrats and the Christian Democrats. So the question is, would you advocate a new January agreement in 2020 to ensure that you will develop your uh, power here? And what kind of in what kind of way are you discussing with the Sweden Democrats? Thank you, Madam Speaker. We negotiate uh, and we talk with the moderate party and the Christian Democrats, never with the Sweden Democrats, and we're never going to do that. So you have to distinguish between real entrepreneurship and pretend entrepreneurship. By taking taxpayers' money, by um, understaffing uh, in elderly care, care homes for the elderly, etc. That's not real entrepreneurship. I don't think a lot of people uh, admire those who cheat to get the money. This hunt for this chase for profits has contributed severely to uh, Swedish schools being poor, and we can also see as a frightening example the uh, county council in Stockholm, uh, where uh, there have been rationalizations and privatizations. So yes, our pictures are different. We don't think that education, care for the elderly, or health care should be governed by the hunt for profits. Thank you very much. That Oops. concludes all the rounds of rejoinders, and the floor now goes to Ebba Bush to, uh, to give an address. Madam Speaker, even though we are not in an economic downturn yet, we still have a crisis in the Swedish municipalities, which befalls the welfare system. Not least true for the healthcare system across the country. Not even the richest regions can manage to give the right care uh, in time to patients. Not even the richest regions can provide good working conditions for their members of staff. In spite of the fact that Sweden already today invests uh, approximately as much in their health care as uh for example, France and the Netherlands, countries that do not struggle with the same type of long queues. The healthcare system needs more resources, of course, no doubt about it. But just allocating more money will not resolve the problems of the healthcare system because it is not the money that is the problem. When a German doctor, on average, meets with three patients in the same time that a Swedish doctor only meets with one patient, neither is it a question to do with laziness or willingness to work or unwillingness to work. No, it's to do with the structure of the health care system. It is obvious that we lack rational reasons to continue to run health care on the principle that 21 different regions, county councils should share responsibility. It's inefficient, bureaucratic and outdated. After eight years working in the social affairs uh, department where we tried different reforms, it was our our conclusion that this responsibility <coughs> needs to be assumed by the state. And that has now been discussed as a possibility by the Liberal Party and the Social Democratic Party. And I want to hear parties who discuss uh, giving support to the state assuming responsibility for the healthcare system. And it shouldn't be decisive where in the country you live. That shouldn't determine your chances of getting timely care. Thank you. Thank you, Isabella Levin from the Green Party, Jonas Sjöstedt from the Left Party, and the Prime Minister Stefan Levin have requested rejoinders. The floor first goes to Stefan Levin, the Prime Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Social Democratic Government introduced in 2006 a piece of legislation that prohibited those who could afford to buy uh, health care to, to, to uh, jump the queue uh, in front of those who can't. Now, the non-socialist government reintroduced this possibility in 2007. Uh, 
the the minister who was responsible at the time said there must never be a question of uh, being able to pay to get health care. Uh, it must be the need for health care that is the um, uh, the uh, argument that should rule. But now we know that this is exactly what happened. I'm convinced that there is strong support in Sweden for the Swedish model where you are given health care and medical care according to what you need and not according to how much you can afford to pay. And that's why it's so worrying to hear Eva Bostor talking about uh, how people should pay more for health care. What do you want to do in the Christian Democrats? Thank you. You will now hear something unkind. I intend oh, something very rare. I intend to answer your question, Prime Minister. We're prepared to support initiatives that make it impossible to initiatives that would ensure that it is not the size of your wallet that determines what health care you're given. Neither will we contribute to alternative or today we introduce no policies to the effect of needing to pay a uh, lot more for the care that you are in need of. Of. That's not our politics. It will not be our politics. But uh, my question goes back to Prime Minister Löfven. Is the Prime Minister prepared to do what is necessary to really reduce the health care queues, uh, to give the health care workers the working conditions they deserve? Are you prepared to review the issue of the state assuming responsibility for the county councils? The Prime Minister. Madam Speaker, we've already initiated uh, strengthening of the resources to healthcare, and we actually have 13,000 more people employed in the Swedish healthcare system now. We are prepared to ensure the financing of Swedish healthcare, but then there are ideas popping up from the Conservative forces whether uh, how this should be financed, and if Eva Bustor is allowed to think freely about this, she has written an article in Svenska Dagbladet where she says that we need to have more private financing and higher fees. They've already uh, presented some proposals, like uh, doing away with free mammographies for women, for example. So exactly what do you want people to pay for? Uh, and what will the next step be in this process? Final rejoinder now from Eva Bushtour. First of all, it's not true that we want to remove services that are free of charge. We spend... 30 billion more in this budget term than the Social Democratic does. 30 million more on welfare services spent by us. And that makes it possible for the regions that find uh, free of charge to be decisive to give uh, patients timely care. They are able to do so to a much greater extent than with the Social Democratic budget. But today we have people who pay about 50 percent in taxes who still feel that they need to spend more money out of their own pockets to ensure sure that they are given timely care. Why? Well, because Prime Minister Livian is the Prime Minister who, time and time again, is a record breaker when it comes to health care queues. Records. That's what we should be discussing today. How can we ensure that we have correct financing, more resources to the welfare systems, more uh, investments than the Social Democrats are prepared to do, but uh, mainly that health care reaches the patients in a good way. Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes this round of rejoinders. And the next reply, the next rejoinder goes to Jonas Röstes from the left party. Madam Speaker, Eva Bush told, we have a very serious welfare crisis. People are being dismissed from the social services. Various activities are being closed down in municipalities. And we have savings that haven't been thought through. There is a desperate need for additional money to the municipalities, at least 10 billion kroner. I, I was hoping that Stefan Levien uh, would have given us some kind of information today about such additional resources, but no such message was being given. Just uh, some half-hearted words about what's going to happen, and that's a pity. Now that we don't get clear information from the government, are you, in the Christian Democrats, prepared to sit down with the moderate party and the left party in the Finance Committee to talk about such an addition? 
We will try it again to answer the question. The answer to Jonas Sjöstedt is yes, we are. I share your concern about the status of Swedish welfare. Uh, Mr. Sjöstedt, we can agree that the situation, not least within healthcare, is alarming, that the January agreement parties make the wrong priorities. The question is, how much more do we agree on? Because the left party wants to increase expenditure by 43.5 billion. That's 44 percent of the GDP and 3 percent more than the economic growth of Sweden. Taxes will be raised by 39 billion at the same time that you cross out the functioning reducing Q's billion. And also, you cannot raise taxes in an uh, amendment budget in the spring. You do that in the autumn or not at all, preferably if you're a Christian Democrat. So, additional funding needs to be found in the already adopted budget. And that's why we have allocated about 7 billion crowns. Possibly uh, that it, there's even more that's already financed that should be redirected to the core of the welfare system. Sir. Services. Can Are you prepared to negotiate about this? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I was hoping that the government would give us the message today that they would allocate extra resources to the welfare system. But we have only seen fine words here. I hope that the government will allocate more money than what Eva Bustol proposes. We need extra money to invest and not just manage the level we're at today. But if there is nothing coming out of the government's budget, uh, then I'm prepared to sit down with the Christian Democrats and the moderate party to ensure that the municipalities get a better situation. Good. Then I think we roll up our sleeves and get going with this. And just to to make sure that the spectators and viewers understand why we are even discussing this at all. Well, it has to do with the fact that even though the autumn budget for this year was only adopted a few weeks ago by this House, it was not possible for Stefan Löfven and Magdalena Andersson uh, to predict in December the crisis that we can now see in the welfare sector across our country today. And both the Christian Democrats and the left party, in different ways, included this as a possibility in our alternatives this autumn. And that's why we are prepared to negotiate an amendment budget that could quickly be processed, not to wait until June. We need to listen to the SOS calls from the municipal municipalities, from the elderly care services and the health care services, both from those who need the care and the assistance and the employees to serve better than this. Thank you. That concludes this round of rejoinder and the next rejoinder will be given by Isabella Levin from the Green Party. Madam Speaker, Eva Bustur and I have a lot in common. <laughs> Our members have worked together uh, to help refugees, and also in this house we've been standing together for a better world, guided by a moral compass to make sure that people, uh, we exposed people are vulnerable people are never left alone. But you've changed your direction now in the European Union. You vote against measures to help refugees in the Mediterranean. And you've also changed your view here uh, at home about uh, young people being able to reunite with their parents. So my question to you, Eva Bushtour, is what do you say to your members who work in churches in order to hide refugees and those who serve up soup to those without documents? How do you explain your turnaround in your immigration policy? Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Sweden has, for a long time, um, had migration policies. Uh, that means that a lot of people are left behind, many of the most vulnerable left behind, very many of the people that we've promised, we've made promises to from this House and from other directions that we will be there for them. These people are often left behind in conflict wrought areas, in areas of unrest, in perfectly inhumane circumstances. Many people, many times these are the elderly who cannot cope with the dangerous illegal routes uh, across the Mediterranean and through Europe. Very often it is sick people, children, and we think that we need to do this in a different way, because the migration policies of Sweden today should uh, 
primarily address the most vulnerable. We still have far too many people applying for help in Sweden and protection in Sweden, people who have no right to receive asylum. Isabella Levine. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I didn't really hear an answer from you. There are people who have the right to asylum who come to Sweden, but you now want uh, children who uh, flee from Syria in very difficult situation. You don't want them to be re reunited with the parents. You said um, during the last uh, term that you didn't want to see any form of collaboration with the Sweden Democrats, but now you apparently you are prepared to cooperate with the Sweden Democrats about anything. So I suppose you no longer agree with the old leader of the, the uh, Christian Democrats um, and name when it comes to the view of the Sweden Democrats that, that we can never share their view of Sweden. Don't you agree that it's dangerous to have a view that sh divides the country into us and them? So what has made you turn around so quickly so that you can cooperate with the Sweden Democrats? Final rejoinder now from Ebba Bush to Madam Speaker, Isabella Levine does not appear to be able to read the papers or my quotes correctly or even to understand a fundamental asylum grounds. If you're a child, if you're an adult and if you need protection, if you need refuge in Sweden, you should be able to be granted that. And you shouldn't have to doubt that in the way that occurs today because of insufficient and incorrect assessments by, for example, the Migration Agency. If you're a child fleeing Syria, you should be able to receive protection in Sweden. That type of family reunification is something we will never counteract. We continue to safeguard that. But I've also been supported by previous party leaders of my own party. If you're safe on your values, then you can discuss them with all the parties elected by the Swedish population in the Swedish parliament. Have discussions based on your own convictions and basic principles and values to stand for what you consider to be important. And that continues to be the case when it comes to issues of welfare and migration policy. Thank you. That uh, concludes all the rounds of rejoinders, and the floor now goes to Yuan Passion for the Liberals for an address. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Dear listeners, I have a daughter who uh, left upper secondary school six months ago. I'm very proud of her. I want her to be able to feel free to be able to find love and create her own life or, or according to her own choice. And that applies to all my children. Next week, it's 18 years ago that another father decided to kill his own daughter because she wanted to choose her own life, Fadime. Sometimes when I'm going to bed at night, I'm worried that someone will hurt my sons or my daughters. When Fadima went to bed at night, she was worried that her own dad would harm her. With the January Agreement as the tool, we have ensured that we can further develop and strengthen the important and, important and difficult work against unrelated violence in all its forms. We had a report just the other day from Norby, a suburb outside Borås, which is a vulnerable area in the west of Sweden. Uh, and it was about girls who do not uh, wear hijab and how uh, a clan system in the area took action against these girls. The Liberals want to see special measures to be taken so that we won't have these vulnerable areas in 10 years' time. The judiciary system has to restore its control in these areas, and poverty in all its form must be fought against. Um, intensely and with a long-term perspective. We talk about a Marshall Plan for the areas with the greatest, there are the most vulnerable. It will take decades to succeed, perhaps, but there are no other liberal alternatives in order to move people from exclusion to inclusion. Rejoinders requested by Ebba bush -Tour. Uh, We first give the floor to Ebba bush -Tour for a rejoinder to this address. Madam Speaker, 
Between the Liberal and the Christian Democrat, there used to be a shared view on criminal law policies and the need for more police officers. Uh, we both felt that the police investigate too few crimes and not enough criminals are being punished. We upheld the New York police as an important example. A important part of their work was to also uh, prosecute so-called everyday crimes. We felt that the government weren't uh, really forceful in this because the Green Party had a veto in practice <coughs> by uh, stopping these reforms. The Liberal Party contributed to increased unsafety because the budget presented in the autumn, if that is implemented, in that case, we will have a savings on the uh, criminal justice system. That would mean that the police and the prosecution authorities can uh, go ahead and do cutbacks. What will you on passion say to those who vote for the Liberals because they thought that more people would be prosecuted and convicted of offences. Thank you, Yuan Pashon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Eva Bushtur and the Christian Democrats raised a very important issue because two years ago we had a moderate and Christian Democratic budget that we indirectly allowed uh, to be adopted. But then last spring, we had to add uh, an additional 800 million to that budget. We have now uh, added another 700 million. And you know what, Eva Bustur, I think we need even more. The discussion that is now taking place in the mass media and that where well, there was a press conference yesterday about um, that is important because to us, uh, as liberals, the criminal just uh, functioning judiciary is important because it protects the most vulnerable. So we have had guarantees and we are working to get 10,000 more employed in the police force. That's uh, absolutely necessary. It may actually be a minimum number and we will do more to ensure that. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. We saw a big increase last year in what uh, what we had and reality changed uh, which means that the budget we had proposed wasn't enough and that was why we added more resources and i'm happy to hear that you have that insight 64 percent of police officers feel that the salary is the most important thing determining whether they will stay and uh, the government did away with uh, that uh, specific investment for police officers courts are only given half of what they requested and uh, the investments that were meant for uh, the um, prosecutor's office that, office that will as a matter of fact be a decrease instead of an increase so uh, that is done in spite of um, uh, crimes brought to justice increasing. The police has also said that in order to reach uh, the objective with 10,000 more police officers in 2024, they are half a billion short. You want passion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I'm happy to hear that Eva Bashur is working for this. As I said in my introductory speech, the January agreement re regulates a number of issues where we take Sweden forward with liberal reforms. One uh, basic uh, idea of this is that we should have 10,000 more employers in the police force, and that has to be accompanied by um, similar measures in the rest of the judiciary system. When I visit my previous workplaces, such as district courts or the police uh, um, authority in Gothenburg, for example, I see how work is lagging behind, which is detrimental to those who are waiting to have their cases heard. And so there's a loss of legal action that uh, we see. You may need to uh, uh, to get a queue ticket to buy things in the off-license, but it shouldn't be that in the law courts. Thank you. That was the end of that round of rejoinders, and the floor now goes to Isabella Levine for an address. Fru <clears> Talman. <throat> Madam Speaker, honoured listeners, this is the third consecutive year where we are number one in the ranking over the countries that have the best climate policy. This is a ranking that's done by international environmental organisations. Emissions are going down in spite of us having experienced a boom in the economy. And, uh, in spite of the fact that it takes time to reform, but now we're being tested. We're 
building a wind farm in Petio. We have a battery factory that is being built in Feleftio. And the first the fossil free carbon industry is built in Lulio, which means that we have green politics and we're creating thousands of jobs uh, across the country. And that is uh, what climate change has led to a new green wave. But still, we have parties who want to end this. It says here in, uh, it's being said here in the chamber that it doesn't matter what we do because Sweden is such a small country and our emissions are at such a low level. And uh, this is wrong. We benefit ourselves, the industry, employment and our environment by doing this. And secondly, if other countries, all countries with those who had less than 2% uh, percent of the emissions, if all those countries were added together, <laughs> then we would be the largest polluters, bigger than China, Russia, India together, the biggest polluter in the world. And thirdly, we do need leadership. We need leadership. And our Climate Act was adopted. Since then, other countries have followed suit. Finland, Denmark, Austria have more ambitious uh, climate objectives than we do. And the world needs uh, this belief in the future. But it's not just in believing or hoping for the best. It's about working for a better future. And I would like to say, like uh, the skier Ingmar Stenmark once said, that I don't know anything about the luck. The only thing I know is that uh, the more I practice, the more the luck of the luck I have. And uh, we need to do things here and now. Thank you. Of Christesson, Eva Bostor, and Eva Bostor have requested rejoinders to uh, Isabella Levin's address. The floor goes to Ulf Christesson. Madam Speaker, today the research report of Swedish policy for a global climate is presented, which means that the global reduction uh, of climate threats must be the objective. They may not agree with either of us, but we may learn something. Then they write, decommissioning of existing nuclear power plants risks leading to increased emissions in our neighboring countries such as Poland and Germany because the export of fossil free uh, energy is reduced and replaced by coal powered uh, plants. So how do you look at this, Isabella Levine, that Swedish climate policy increases the emissions around the world? Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. First of all, Sweden has never had such a, a surplus of electricity as we do today. We export to Finland, for example, and they are still struggling with building the nuclear power plant that they decided on in the beginning of this century, and the costs have tripled since that decision was made. And when it will finally be completed, the costs for the consumers will be much, much higher compared to the costs for those who buy cheap wind power. We have an explosion there. We have some 18 terawatt hours in the pipeline in addition. And this is being built on market terms and uh, sound market conditions. And when you talk about market conditions and decisions that it's not uh, profitable, well, it is not profitable to uh, refurbish these old uh, reactors. And what are you thinking about? What owners would do this? Russian, uh, Chinese investors? There are no market actors here who are willing. Thank you, Ulf Christesson. Madam Speaker, I note that Isabella Levine does not even touch upon my question in her answer. She's nowhere close to it. Cause, so I want to know, how does Isabella Levine look at the f warnings that the decommissioning of Swedish nuclear power plants increases the emissions in other parts of the world? Let me simplify the question. Do you believe that these researchers are wrong when they say that if we decommission Swedish nuclear power, the there will be an increase in emission in other countries which risks affecting the global climate. Are they wrong? A final rejoinder, Isabella Levine. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. All countries have signed this agreement saying that we're going to 
uh, manage the objectives. Germany is uh, decommissioning nuclear. They have explosions in um, fossil free fuels. Denmark has even more ambitious targets compared to Sweden. And uh, the carbon, the coal that uh, uh, researchers are referring to, well, if countries live up to the promises, we will not have that. We import a few days a year, and we are not uh, importing uh, coal energy, coal-based energy from Germany, but we're importing from Norway. But the moderate party, you have uh, left behind the promise where we had investments. Uh, and with your stance, we will just create uh, uncertainty, insecurity when it comes to new renewables, something we need. We need to invest in transmissions and storage, not in nuclear power plants. Thank you. That concludes the that round of rejoinders, and the next rejoinder is going to be given by Eva Bushtur. Madam Speaker, the January agreement and its tax policy is very different from what the alliance has put forward. When we uh, as the Christian Democrats have targeted our tax reductions. It's mainly been focused on low and medium income earners. That was obvious in the Christian Democrat budget, which gave several hundred kroner more per month to low income families. And our family policy makes it possible for uh, more people to buy their own house or to save money. Now it's different. Although the main reform in the government's budget was to reduce taxes. Teachers, nursing, aged and police officers got absolutely nothing. But Isabella Levine had a tax reduction that corresponded to uh, two monthly wages for a nursing aide. So why is it more important that a minister gets uh, a tax reduction than um, a nursing aid. Well, uh, thank you. I do not think it's more important for a minister to have a tax reduction compared to nursing aid. It should be the other way around. But I also think it's important that politicians are honest, or somewhat honest at least, in what they say in the Swedish Riksdag, because we have an audience, also TV audience, and they believe in what we're saying. And you, as a matter of fact, uh, offered something similar when you wanted to, to do a way with the tax deductions. Um, and you did that because you wanted to be in government. So my question is, how could you present such an offer if you think that this is problematic? Was it that important to be allowed uh, into government together with uh, the Sweden Democrats? So do you want to uh, sacrifice the assist nurses' assistance? Madam Speaker. Well, I heard this attack from Mikael Damberg on television last week, and now it comes from Isabella Levine, and it sounds as if they've really detected something that is reveal that reveals our policy. We've been totally open with this. I have no problem with hardworking people gets reduced taxes and get a little bit left more left in their wallet at the end of the month. What I think is entirely indefensible is that a minister gets. A, a tax reduction of 50,000 kroner this year, whereas the police officer gets absolutely nothing. And when we reduce taxes, everyone benefits. And we have targeted mainly at low and me medium income earners. And in our budget, it was not a priority to reduce the additional tax for high income earners, but we would have done that. Plus, given more money to, child, to families with children, that was never our intention. Thank you, Isabella Levine, final rejoinder. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And, well, Ebba Bush and Thor, thank you for that intervention. I'm not sure it was all that clear. Obviously, you think that this is good, that hard-working High income earners, they get the tax reductions, but I stand up and fight for what the Green Party wants, and that is not to prioritize those who make the most. Never will be. But uh, evidently, that is what you want, Ebba Bush Thor, and you were willing to go along with that to get an alliance government, and you've just confirmed that, which is good. 
this government, what this government is now doing is to uh, look at pensions, uh, pensions for those who have worked a uh, full working life who need more. We also have the housing subsidies and we also give support so that new cheap apartments can be built. We have a number of reforms which will mean that it will be much simpler for those who have the biggest needs today. But you, Eva Bush Tour, together with the moderate party, when you decide on budgets, then it's only for the rich. And thank you. That concludes uh, that set of rejoinders. Uh, and that means that this party leader's uh, debate uh, has come to an end as well. And that concludes the interpretation. The interpretation stops here. Kristdemokraterna som ersättare från och med den 14 januari till och med den 29 mars under Mikael Anefors, Kristdemokraternas ledighet. Punkt 3. Anmälan om kompletteringsval. Cecilia Engström, Kristdemokraterna som suppleant i socialutskottet från och med idag den 29 mars under Mikael Anefors, Kristdemokraternas ledighet. Jag förklarar henne vald. Punkt 4. Ansökan om ledighet. Paula Bjärle, Sverigedemokraterna har lämnat in en ledighetsansökan för tiden från och med den 29 februari till och med den 31 mars 2020. Ansökan ska enligt femte kapitel fjärde paragrafen andra stycket i riksdagsordningen prövas av kammaren. Enligt praxis tillåts endast ledighet för uppdrag som statssekreterare, sjuk- och föräldraledighet samt ledighet för internationella uppdrag. Paula Bjärlers ansökan grundar sig på andra skäl. Efter att ha samrått med gruppledarna föreslår talmannen att ansökan avslås. Paula Bjärler har begärt ordet i denna fråga. Varsågod. Tack fru talman för ordet i detta något oortodoxa ärende. Jag har full förståelse för att praxis utvecklas över tid som en lagstiftning är gällande. Jag har roat mig med att läsa förarbetena till den första riksdagsordningen och första diskussionerna som hade kring att vi skulle ha möjlighet att ta in ersättare i riksdagen. Och där var det tydligt, det står citat, föreligger lagar för fall, bör givetvis ansöka beviljas. För övriga fall bör liksom för närvarande en liberal praxis tillämpas. Ledamot bör kunna beviljas ledighet för enskilda angelägenheter, såsom familjeangelägenheter, sköten av egen tjänst eller eget företag, affärsresa med mera. Synen på hur det ska vara att vara riksdagsledamot och hur vi bäst representerar landet har förväxlats genom åren. Så är givetvis fallet. För egen del så är jag övertygad om att mitt arbete som riksdagsledamot inte försämras utan tvärtom förbättras av att jag får möjlighet att också vara den person jag är. Jag har arbetat i det här huset i snart nio år. Jag har genom åren sett många kollegor och riksdagsledamöter och andra som jobbar inom den här branschen få sina liv mer eller mindre förstörda av att arbetet kräver att man hela tiden